It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. I know it's going to be a long one because I've got one of the best panels ever. Paris Martineau, Glenn Fleischman, and Dan Morin. Of course, we're going to talk about the upcoming Apple event and what to expect. And then a very deep conversation about AI art. Is it legit? And a doctor who used his truck to perform a vasectomy. It's not what you think. It's all coming up next on Twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is, is Twit. Twit. This is Twit. This Week in Tech. Episode 891. Recorded Sunday, September 4th, 2022. Use the Rivian? That's nuts. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Podium. Join more than 100,000 businesses that already use Podium to streamline their customer interactions. See how Podium can grow your business. Watch a demo today at podium.com slash twit. And by ClickUp, the productivity platform that'll save you one day a week on work guaranteed. Use the code TWIT to get 15% off ClickUp's massive unlimited plan for a year, meaning you can start reclaiming your time for under $5 a month. Sign up today at ClickUp.com, but hurry, this offer ends soon. And by Zapier. Zapier makes it easy to connect all your apps, automate routine tasks, and streamline your processes. Try Zapier for free today at Zapier.com slash twit. And by Stamps.com. Get ahead of the holiday chaos this year. Sign up at Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, enter the code TWIT, and you'll get a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and a digital scale. It's time for TWIT This Week in Tech, the show where we talk about the week's tech news. And, you know, sometimes we put shows together with great thought, and we really, you know, kind of balance it. Sometimes we just throw the names in the air and they come down. And sometimes that's better. This is one of those, maybe, I don't know, maybe Jason Howell had an idea, but I am thrilled by this panel. Let's say hi to Paris Martineau. She was a reporter for The Information. Always great to see her. Very crafty. Today, no sequin, be sequined, no bejeweled mannequins in the background. I'm going to, I'll move it in frame at That's the break. Okay. Just wait. I'm going to keep people on their toes, you know. I uh, bet kind you, of, though. Kind of shifting tableau. The rest of the panel will recognize something right behind you. And let's find out when we ask, when we say hello to, <laughs> yeah, Glenn Fleischman. Yeah. I think he's, he, I think I recognize the chuckle from Glenn.fun, longtime uh, reporter for a variety of Macintosh uh, magazines, former Jeopardy contestant, type historian. Hello, Glenn. Hello. Uh, do I recognize a... Uh, I see the transparent speaker. I've forgotten the exact yeah. name of it. Is that an original... It was Harmon Carmen Carmon 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 they are, and yet they sound fantastic, and they look very sure. cool. Um, I've They're got beautiful. them connected to a record player in a fun little mishmash of technology there. Is there yeah. a person standing behind those Harman Kardon sticks? There is. That is a lamp um, shaped like a man with a uniquely placed light switch that I will leave to your uh, hand. Did you make that? I did not, but I bought it from a vintage dealer who Excellent. I really enjoy. And every time Excellent. you flip it on, you just go. <laughs> every time it flips on, you know, I will often have people come over and they're like, "So where's the light switch?" And I'm like, "Guys, <laughs> there's only one well, thing there's on There's only here. one place to look. <laughs> wow, that's hysterical. Fragile. <laughs> that's a, that's a uh, also with us, great to have Dan Morin. This is the I think one of the first things you've done off your uh, paternity leave. Is that right? You first. You are my first stop on the return for my paternity yes. leave. There you go. Six Colors uh, co-editor with Jason Snell. He has been off for a couple of months with a brand new baby. How old's the baby? Baby's about six weeks old. Oh, so it's not even a couple of months. <gasps> no. How's it been? It's been tiring. Uh, can, I can need a better <laughs> camera that doesn't show you the bags under my eyes. Uh, but other than that, it's been wonderful. It's I been love wonderful. it. Well, I hope even if you're on paternity leave, you write because... We are waiting for volume four of the Galactic Cold War saga. I have here, you thankfully sent me the, the latest 
uh, volume, which is book three, The Nova Incident. Uh, all right. three of them. By the way, really good. You know, I'll be honest. I it's uh, this is terrible to say, but I wasn't expecting much. Okay, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> oh I like to have God. a low bar. Leo, low you're right. starting off no, absolutely no, let brutal. Me, let me explain. <laughs> Not a yeah, you were just at a cool. really right. low bar. Not a, not 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 in in any way a, a, a reflection on you, Dan. It's just that I know quite a few people in our business. You know, that's the old canard. I have a everybody's got a novel in their desk drawer, mm -hmm. and the few people I know who have released those novels probably should not have. But now, did you start as a writer and then you know as a sci-fi writer and then become a tech writer? It was always a passion of mine, and I. But you know, I got out of college and didn't really know what I was doing, and I worked IT for a while, and then I started writing professionally. And once I had done that, I think it really helped me hone a lot of stuff about my fiction. So I kind of went back to it after spending my first couple of years in tech journalism because it, it felt like, oh, you know, now I kind of understand. I work with deadlines, and I've yeah. had to do this regularly and put in all these hours. And you can't help but get better. I think at those kinds of tasks, if you do them enough. So I think it, they kind of worked together nicely. Well, and that's what I look for in a good novelist, somebody who makes deadlines. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it's harder than you think. No. Right? Hey, just ask George R.R. R. Martin, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That guy's really Patrick, suffering for not making a deadline, let me tell you. Patrick Rothfuss, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there are quite a few in, the, uh, in our... Dan, Dan was the person I thought most likely to become a breakout science fiction nice. author bestseller yeah. and i think you're well on the way to doing that no, i'm really, reading the uh, really was it the the beta edition of the caledonian gambit i think i read uh pre-release and i was like yes this is that was a long some fine ago. work and then i read the release version i'm like man this guy also revises which is incredible <laughs> i mean i like the i like the 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 uh, draft and then the, the release yeah. version was fantastic but so. there is a, there's a, 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 a somewhat of a leap from nonfiction writing to fiction writing and yeah. not everybody can make that leap. Some have <laughs> fallen in the crevasse in between. Uh, so I just wanted to say it's really good. And everybody should, if you like sci-fi, uh, this is it. The Galactic Cold War saga. And you tell me, you've told me that there may be a fourth one in the works. Yeah, I well, I'd like to. I've been working on this long overarching sort of plot line and I am hoping I get a chance to sort of bring that to fruition. But each of the I will say, like, you know, a lot of people don't like to pick up a series unless it's done. But I tried to also structure it so that each of the books tells like a, a standalone story in its own regard as well. But like with a, in the background, right, there's like an overarching plot that's developing slowly. So I think you can still get a lot of enjoyment out of the individual volumes uh, as it goes along without worrying too much about like, oh no, will the series ever be finished? You also have the best publisher ever, Angry Robot. <laughs> I just love that <laughs> That's <name>. true. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so long not, as you uh, not finish the series within 30 years, you'll oh, have a leg right. up on R.R. Martin. If they start shooting a season one of your show, let's say you have five years to get the last book done. That's the... That's good. That's or a comfortable, right? at least the next right book done, you know? <laughs> it doesn't even have to be the last right. book. Right. can just be right. a edition. Got to stay far enough ahead of the game there. Yeah. Or Netflix you could do up. you could do uh, like the wheel of time and just die before you're done. <laughs> yeah, you always have you considered that? <laughs> you know, Leo has Wait, that's one way to avoid, for that's you, one way yeah. to avoid deadlines. I, I just, just had a kid. Come on, I'm already feeling the mortality. Very, I don't need a little more of that. Just, Important this part is of very deadlines. Very spicy, Leo today. Yeah. <laughs> you no, know, you could die. I don't know about these folks. This is well, just, spicy, you know, man. Get to know Brian be, Sand uh, Brandon Sanderson ahead of time, and and you'll be you'll be set. I will tell you, I know I actually have met Brandon because uh, we have the same agent. Ah, well, he, you so know what? I, I know him. Robert Jordan was very lucky because he he passed mm -hmm. away before finishing this. How many fourteen book series? Seventeen. So, it's ridiculous. Maybe fourteen. It's, it's a lot. Insane. Yeah. And uh, of course, he died before finishing it. It's pretty clear he, you know, he was going to keep writing until he died. Thank God he had Brandon Sanderson to come along and and finish it and finish it in in, in high style. Yeah. Uh, of all of the TV uh, productions, though, the Wheel of Time TV show is the worst. Uh, I, mean, I don't just, know. There are some pretty bad TV productions. I but I mean, out of classic I science like fiction, I guess I should <laughs> yeah. say. Yeah. I don't have anything. I have no uh, uh, no loyalty to the book series. I hadn't read it. I kind of like Wheel of Time. See, yeah, that's, had... that's pretty much how it works. If you've read it, yeah. you'll hate it. And if you've oh, never I read see, it, yeah, you'll yeah. like the TV show. 
Um, and it is better now that I think of it than Foundation, which was which truly awful. I had so much hope for it, and then by the end, it's like, what are you doing? Horrible. Oh, come on. Horrible. But I don't know. I don't know what they anyway, were doing. How about Lord I'm, of the Rings? Are we liking Lord of the Rings? I'm going to ask Glenn about Lord of the Rings. Glenn is a big Lord of the Rings fan. I, yeah, I'm sitting here with my 15-year-old who has not read Lord of the Rings, and I'm like, oh, well, they're not telling a story about Feanor, the creator of the Silmarils, and his original name was Mel, and I'm like, oh, my God, I don't remember that I know all this stuff. Why do I know all this stuff? It's the second age. All the age useful and, information. Anyway. All the useful information like you had to every useful room thing for. you've oh. forgotten, it's just I taken out by names by, of elves. <laughs> it's it's, it's not which being rod was, but Kalimbror was the friend of the dwarf. Oh, no. uh, I'm a little I'm a little confused. Have they... Have have they? It's only been two two episodes. Have they botched the uh, series yet, or is it pretty much faithful to what little we know? I, I think they're doing. Uh, I think they're doing an incredibly good job of trying to bring in new people without a hundred percent offending people. Yeah. Uh, like I feeling. was 30 years ago. The Cimmerilla, the Cimmerilla, <laughs> ra, 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 ra. Did, Cimmer, Cimmerilla, yeah, the Cimmerilla did not, <laughs> did not, did not specify a lot of this stuff. For instance, and I saw somebody note this, yeah. uh, and I don't think this is a spoiler, um, but they're sailing, uh, the ship into the Grey Havens, uh, our, uh, our princess, I won't say names, our princess has been awarded, uh, release into the Grey Havens. She's on the ship. They're standing there, the warriors, long voyage, I think, but they're standing there the whole time in their armor. Then these maidens yeah. come out and help undress them. Yes, yes. Uh, are the, so here's my question. <laughs> are, the, are the maidens <laughs> going to, are they going to sail the ship back for the next trip or are they going into the Grey it's Havens? A, I think it's a one-use ship. It seems like it feels it seems like pretty, it's not going to survive. The, it doesn't seem like it's turning around again. Yeah. Where are those but, maidens yeah. going? They yeah. even I, got they, all this extra know. garb. There's some people who can go, but so there's there's these different order of there's celestial beings and the, and the but the but elves have the servants. And, the, and then the weird well, thing well, is, so the the servants take the wet weapons and the armor from the elves and they throw them on the ground. They don't. They don't like fold so them up, and put them away. They just go here. Yeah. I mean, it's like could, what? What were you doing? Couldn't they have they, just they, done that? They, Couldn't they, they just they take sell off them their own for, armor? They sell them for scrap later on. They can repurpose it and recycle. Oh, you know, that, put a little. Because they've got to get another boat to get back. Okay, that's, that's right. In Wings of Desire. Right. The, the armor things in Wings of Desire, right? So this all yes. connects up to the Peter oh. the Peter Falk universe. It all comes back to Vim Vendors in the end. Vim, Vend <laughs> Vim Vendors. Um, how about the House of the Dragon? Are we uh, are we happy with the House of the Dragon? I watched the first one and thought it was better than I expected it was going to be. I was not super invested, but my wife was actually like, oh, I really like to watch this. So like, all right, we'll sit down and watch it. And I don't know. I, I thought it was interesting. Having felt like the Game of Thrones show ended on pretty sour note for me, I was more than pleasantly surprised by this and having a little more, uh, you know, I thought like having the positioning the female character was a little more agency and making a more involved story and like sort of focusing in a bit too, right? Like rather than having like, there's a 6 million characters and they're all over this continent. Instead, it's like a smaller group and yeah, I don't know, we'll see where it goes. I'll watch the next few. I feel like, Glenn, you're a little bruised still from season eight uh, of the Game of Thrones. I've never seen a single episode what? or a portion of oh. that uh, never Throne mind. show. Never I just mind. didn't, it didn't strike me as, I'd read George R. R. Martin before he started writing that series, and I liked some of his, I liked his earlier, funnier stuff better. As I was, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Before he was cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm starting the show with some light material because we're going to get pretty heavy right off the bat. Uh, we talked about this on uh, Wednesday with uh, uh, our wonderful Mike Masnick from Tech Dirt, who has really kind of uh, burst a socket on this uh, children's online safety bill that was just passed in California. We're waiting for the governor to sign it into law. It seems like a good idea. Who wouldn't want to protect children online? Uh, and of course, if you're not in California, you're probably thinking you can take the rod pile or third down. I don't know why that's there. <laughs> but, uh, there is no rod pile in this story whatsoever. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, that's the New York on? Times, have baby. Lost, have you lost control? <laughs> I think he's lost control of the lower third. We, uh, wheel that the the lower back to the become uh, sentient. <laughs> I was going to say, Leo, all of your smart assistants have taken over the show. So scrub the launch. Scrub the launch. Ah, yeah, that was the Artemis story. That'll be coming later. Mm -hmm. um, none of you are in California, right? Dan, are you in California? I can't remember where you are, Dan. 
Uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. That's why your window is open. If you were in California, it would be <laughs> hun oh hunkered my God. down now. It's about 109 degrees outside. Um, oh, yeah. And you guys don't believe in air conditioning, right? Yeah, that's that's the funny thing is uh, people in California say, well, we have natural air conditioning until it gets hot. And then... <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> I mean, we don't. I, they don't say much of anything. change might uh, change yeah. that for you. Yeah. Um, so this is maybe not on your radar, but it sure is uh, for uh, us in California. And Mike Masnick, who's also in California. The New York Times story about this, you would never, you know, think there was a problem. The, the California Age Appropriate Design Code Act requires any webs, unlike COPPA, where uh, it only affect, affects websites that are aimed at ch children. This is a, a website, any website, that might have somebody under 18 visited, which I think is any website. Certainly ours. Mm. Certainly Mike Masnick's. Uh, so if you have the potential that somebody under 18 might visit your website, then you are required to, first of all, know the age of everybody who visits your website. Problem number one. Uh, that's pretty intrusive. We don't know the age of anybody who listens to our shows or visits our website. I don't want to know their age, but in order to uh, enforce this law, I need to. In fact, Mike's concern was, oh, uh, am I going to have to do age verification? And if I do, how am I going to do that? He says, it may be face ID. You may have to start, because you've got to know... You've got to know how old these people are. Then you have to look at every single feature of your site and do uh, what they call a, a DPIA, kind of like an environmental impact report on each feature of your site and how it might infect people under 18. And that has to be, you have to do it because it has to be available should the Attorney General of California ask, you have 72 hours to produce that. Yeah, this surely feels like the kinds of uh, rules that go into effect in countries that are trying to prohibit speech or use workarounds. Uh, like you know, India has imposed laws, and you know, Russia has imposed more more draconian ones. And even India, uh, ostensibly a democracy, has imposed laws that that restrict freedom in the name of safety or uh, freedom from libel or other things. And they're meant to chill speech. And this isn't per se designed that way, but it has all the hallmarks of one. It's uh, expensive. To, or impossible to implement, it's probably, I'm not a lawyer, uh, it's probably unconstitutional based on what I'm reading, does not seem to fit within the permissibility of, of um, you know, how this could possibly be enforced. So the, the, bar, the burden is undue and it's chilling of speech. And so you're kind of like, well, how did it get this far? Uh, I think Mike pointed out in his article is like, well, nobody wants to, you know, you were saying, you know, oh, no, I'm opposed to protecting children online. Yeah. I just clipped no. that out, what I just said, right? Yeah. Glad Valation was opposed, you know, I'm not, I'm not, but no one's going to vote. No politician is going to say, I'm voting against the protecting children from terrible things online <laughs> bill. Exactly. It's, you know, which is why it passed in the Senate 30 to nothing. Don't we don't we do this every few decades? I mean, I'm remembering when I was a teenager, the Communications Decency Act was oh, the yeah. big sort of hot button issue at the time, which, you know, that was the the heady days of 1996 or so. Right. Yeah. Where the Internet was not at all what it is today. But there was still the sort of the same idea like, oh, we've got to figure out a way to flag stuff that might be objectionable so that people aren't exposed to it. And ultimately, I think it ended up being sort of impossible to deal with because how do you do that, right? How do you do that on the internet? How do you control for that kind of information? If you can't even control for it in, you know, other public sphere spaces, it seems, I agree with Glenn, it seems like an unduly onerous task for uh, people who are, you know, otherwise trying to be law abiding. Actually, I mean, the CDA the ended up having a positive impact. Ron Wyden said, you know what, we're going to have to make an exemption here for mm. uh, social media yeah, and other sites and the section 230 was written oh, and thank right. goodness. Go ahead. I'm sorry, uh, Paris. I was saying, I think the thing that sticks out to me is, I mean, how are we expecting all of these different sites or service providers to be able to identify with certainty whether or not the person accessing your website is a child. I mean, obviously we have currently kind of like tracking tools. You can look at website analytics and see the demographics of your users, but a lot of social media sites and providers generally are kind of making their tools in a way that purposefully ignores anybody who could be under 18 because you don't want to deal with that sort of data. 
And let's say even if you somehow devised a perfect way to uh, send a flag up when any cell phone owned and operated by someone under 18 accessed your website, that still wouldn't cover situations where like most kids are probably using their parents' iPad or parents' phone for these sort of things. It just seems like a very technical question that is being answered by a kind of a very vague blank blanket order. I, it's designed to impose enforcement, right? It's designed to be violated unintentionally and easily and thus allow government to intervene. Yeah, and Mike raises that issue. In fact, he was told, I think, by the sponsors of the bill, well, don't worry, the, you know, the California Attorney General decides who's prosecuted. Uh, and one would, <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. And one would hope that the AG would say, well, you know, Twit or Tech Dirt or uh, the information, yeah, 18 year olds read it, but it's not, they're not a threat to 18 year olds. The AG would get to decide. But as Mike points out, well, what if I write an article that's critical of the California Attorney General, which he does a lot apparently? Uh, then, then what happens? Is it, what is if this it, law goes to effect in Texas and you write something critical of that exactly. Attorney General? Yeah. Uh, or, I mean, a lot of times cases like this too, I feel like unduly target, you know, people in, community like such as the lgbtq communities too right where it's like well what is considered objectionable content right this is the kind of thing we're running into with the book bannings that are popping up all across the country is that you know you have governments and local like you know city and municipality governments that are like well i don't want my kid exposed to this so i'm going to you know try to enforce the local school library to get rid of these books because i just don't agree with them so who gets to decide you know certainly what falls under objectionable content and how exactly that gets protected the other weird thing about this bill it was pr primarily written by a british baroness director of uh, one of the bridget jones movies who dropped her hollywood career to protect children online she says Anytime that is not I hear the where words, I thought that sentence was going. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a weird Any, direction. Anytime I hear United Kingdom and protect children, I want to run the other direction. because they're, they're so bad at everything they do there. There's been so many scandals and conflicts. <clears throat> the whole uh, the Jimmy Savile thing with the BBC. I mean, like large and small, I think the United Kingdom has done a terrible job protecting children from predators online and off in government, in politics, in entertainment. And you're like, okay, yeah, we really want to follow their lead because they, they know what's right. Is this I mean, Cory Doctorow has written so effectively oh, about yeah, the failures absolutely. of the UK. Yeah, he lived there for a long time. Is this uh, ignorance on the part of lawmakers? Like they're, they're meaning... They want to do the right thing, and they, you know, they, they just don't understand the impact of what they're doing, or is it some sort of malevolence? Uh, certainly, the Baroness seems to have some sort of malevolence against the open internet. Um, do you think there is a trend? It feels like po politicians these days, it's not merely to protect the children. They want to take down big tech. They don't like it. I mean, well, something that I think about a lot is, I, as part of my job and all of our jobs, we end up watching these big tech hearings that we have every mm -hmm. couple of months over the mm -hmm. last couple of years. And as, I remember the first couple that I watched, I was like, oh, this is going to be interesting, you know, an actual like political <laughs> discussion about yeah. what's going on. It was not that. It is mostly just politicians giving a, a one minute stump speech, uh, totally unhinged or unrelated to the thing they're actually discussing. And I think that's what we're seeing here in some ways is it is partially ignorance, but partially a lot of like modern day politicians have realized that the way to get attention from your base or the sort of people that you want to bring into your base is by making big bold statements like bringing down tech, you know, making all the children safe, regardless of whether or not that actually has any teeth in it. And it we, the end result of that is sometimes you get policies like this that can have disastrous unintended consequences. There's a there's both a carrot and a stick. There's the the threat, the fear that a soundbite will be used against you. Oh, he's against protecting children online. Uh, but there's also the carrot that it makes a great soundbite that might get you some votes if you say, yeah, she's uh, she's really she voted to protect the kids online. So uh, it's the problem is soundbites. Uh, it's just posturing. I think you're I think, exactly. I think a right. lot of the. There is ignorance at the base of it, too, because I think it also presupposes this fallacy that there is somehow a switch you can flip that will protect, you know, make it per the system perfectly functional in a way that protects uh, children, right? Like, we entertain this idea that, like, 
oh, well, technology can solve this issue for us, right? And that we just, you know, technology is very black and white, one and zero. And it's like, well, you know, it can obviously tell you whether or not you're able to consume this information. But that's, you know, I think as Paris pointed out, it's very difficult to know who is consuming this information. I think also about things like libraries that have, you know, computers available for people to access the internet um, who don't might otherwise not have, you know, ways to do that. Uh, how do you tell who's using that, right? Like, how do you tell who's on the other end of that? So I think it. people think tech is very clear cut when they don't know anything about it. But, they, you know, anybody who spends time with it realizes like, no, this is extremely nuanced and there's a lot of gray area. Well, this brings me back to the whole, uh, well, there's two things. One is the overarching issue is that I think we probably all agree. I won't speak for other people, but I think it's likely that we know that the big uh, social media companies and other companies in most cases are failing to protect children online. They're doing things that are actively bad for children. They don't seem to have any compunction about it. And no one has an idea of precisely how to stop it except through public disclosure, whistleblowing, uh, threats by legislators, but nothing... There's no compulsion, particularly in countries with expansive free speech laws and commercial speech laws. Um, people feel impotent to solve that problem. So we know there are problems. Instagram used to promote uh, eating disorders, very, and and they've made great strides in that. But you know, there, there's just all of this, um, all of this negative content aimed at children, uh, algorithm fed often that has some kind of beneficial effect. But it also reminds me, Dan, what you were just saying of uh, when they kept talking about. I think it was the Clinton administration later trying to bring this up like well what if we had a special key that only law enforcement could access only in very particular cases otherwise the encryption would be perfect and protected you know they're talking about end-to-end -end <laughs> encryption it's like well there's no way to build an algorithm like that and every encryption expert in the world agrees but nobody on the political side wants to accept that they don't want to accept the technological problem that you can't have a system with a key that only legitimate parties can use same thing right. here is how do you prevent harm to children which is active and underway without also chilling speech. I was terrified for my children that they grew up in this environment. And fortunately, I think we managed to avoid, you know, any significant problems, but I'm sure we all have stories or know people have stories of children being, uh, you know, harassed online or singled out or groomed or so forth. It's just a, a massive problem made worse by many of these companies. Also, people don't want to hear that the the hard solutions to this problem are awful, all often ones that require like societal change and work <laughs> rather than just technology, which can solve it at the you know snap of your fingers, right? Like people are like, oh, there's a shortcut. We just make the technology do that, right? Um, and yeah, nobody wants to think about the fact that it's like, no, that's that's a band aid, and it's not a particularly good one. It's a band aid on a gushing, you know, <laughs> amputated arm or something. It's not going <laughs> to fix your problem. I also wonder if Baroness Kidron, if if uh, she used to work in Hollywood, if uh, Hollywood were told, oh no no, you have to make sure that every movie you make is appropriate for somebody under eighteen, or every novelist <laughs> had to make sure every novel was appropriate for somebody under eighteen. I think they would bridle at those kinds of restrictions, sure. as they should. We we don't What's want to design the mean? world for people under eighteen. Don't and, forget and, Tipper Gore. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Well, and I mean, what is appropriate mean in that case? Even right, like you know, a, a, first of all. Kids at different ages have different levels of maturity and different levels of appropriateness. A 13-year-old and a 17-year-old are going to have very different levels of what they think is appropriate. I mean, I definitely went to, you know, rated R movies as a 17-year-old and probably with my parents, you know, went to rated R movies younger if it was like a serious uh, topic or something like that. But uh, yeah, how do you how do you deem what is appropriate? The rate, you know, the ratings actually is a good system because all the ratings were designed to do is to inform you or parents mm. ahead of time. Here's the content, not to censor the content. Uh, so I'm not sure the rating. I think the ratings, I think, kind of worked. Uh, I don't know. Would you want to rate every website on the Internet and say this website rated R? I don't know if that's appropriate either. Yeah. yeah. Who would who would do it? I mean, the motion picture. Right. Uh, Association of America had uh, a reason to do it. I mean, a lot of organizations, a lot of trade groups grew up specifically to address uh, a preventing regulation from going into effect by voluntarily adhering to standards right. and enforcing the them. The code. And yeah. Yeah. Right. And so who wants a law? But, but in this case, I think, you know, how do you protect children? Um, even from there's some very coarse things like how do you protect predators there's you know I, I have this discussion a lot it's not that there are so many predators in the world i want to believe that the number of people who are pedophiles and active predators against other people 
is a relatively small percentage of humanity, a very small percentage. I want to believe the internet, that, too. I'm not sure that that's the, the case, but I want to believe I don't that. know either. Well, let's, pre let's pretend it's the case briefly, but say that <laughs> the internet is an amplification force. So it doesn't matter if it's one in 100,000 right. people or one in a million is out after children. If they can access 10 million children and winnow it down and find one near them or that they can reach out to, it's a, it's a, a yield issue. And so online services need to impose their own protections that reduce that yield potential. Um, and that's where I think things are failing is I don't think they have a motivation to do it. There's no financial benefit. There's no regulatory framework and they haven't yet suffered significantly from it. So when there's backlash, like there was a lot of backlash against Facebook for, um, all the revelations from, uh, Oh, I forgot the, Eng the group in England. Uh, Cambridge Yes, thank you. Right. So they had backlash. It seemed like it affected their market price. There was the threat of a lot of regulation. There were open hearings, right? But I don't think we've seen the same concerted effort that's gone uh, into uh, the sort of diffuse choices that have led to children being endangered. Occasionally something will leap up and Facebook will say, oh, okay, we're going to uh, disable all contents on or comments on videos uploaded by people under 18. Or didn't they just say they're going to make all uploaded videos private by default on yeah, YouTube? YouTube. Is that it? For yeah, if you're under so, 17, yeah. Right. So these band-aids, but they do it only in response to the most out outrageous stuff. So it's possible this law being passed, maybe it gets signed, it's held up instantly in the courts. Obviously, you can imagine every giant tech company files for an injunction uh, and it takes years to resolve conceivably. I and also then by then, hmm? can imagine every, every state legislature, well, at least Texas, Florida, and others saying, oh, good idea and passing a similar bill, um, which makes it harder but and harder. But with their own um, slant, like specifications yeah, for right, what is good right. or bad for children. Right. You know, obviously, given what we've seen in Texas, that would probably include a lot of anti LGBTQ right. sort of points, as well as, you know, maybe content around women's right to, you know, choose is also considered bad for children. I think it gets really tricky when you are handing over, like, content controls um, and censorship opportunities to these different state um, legislatures in such a uh, vague way. This brings up something, and you, you added this link to the uh, rundown, Glenn. Uh, I wasn't going to talk about it, but I think it's appropriate to talk about it, which is uh, the, the battle between uh, Cloudflare and uh, Kiwi Farms, which is a horrendous... Yeah horrific website yeah. I don't even want to mention the name of because it's really been used to dox people to target people to swat people uh, by the way both political persuasions it's just a, a nasty right. nasty site Cloudflare was protecting it uh, with their DDoS services uh, and or as early as recently as a couple of days ago Matthew Prince said we are not going to stop protecting them that's what we do we don't judge uh, we just uh, protect these, you know, websites, and everybody has a right to speak. Uh, they ch he changed his mind, I think, under incredible pressure. But all, he says also because it, we see so many um, dangerous uh, threats on Kiwi farms. I and mean, I believe right before um, Cloudflare ended up making the decision to end its relationship with uh, the website, they there had been posts on the forum about people being like, oh, we heard in this podcast that this um, Twitch streamer was maybe going to go to, I believe it was a poutine place oh, in Lord. Belfast, and they looked up, yeah. put a list of every poutine place oh in God. Belfast, and somebody had said, oh, I've planted bombs at three of them, and other Ugh. ones like, I have men with guns waiting outside of one of them. It escalated dramatically. This is a um, Canadian Twitch streamer, Clara Serenity, who actually fled yeah. to Ireland to yeah, be because, safe from Kiwi yeah. Farms threats and they just followed her right there. I mean, because she, I believe, had been uh, swatted multiple times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She'd been doxxed. Her whole family had been doxxed. It had escalated beyond... I mean, it had escalated and then escalated again and then escalated again. I also think it's interesting that, I mean, the way that Cloudflare came to this decision um, with regards to saying, no, 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 we're not going to sever this business relationship again and again, public statements. And then two days later, deciding to do it after increased pressure is kind of the exact same way that this broke down, I believe, with 8chan and Daily Stormer. That's right. Whenever they mm -hmm. kicked yeah. them they resisted off over that the last too. couple of years. Yeah. But and then I a couple of days later, 
they, they gave in. Did it. I have yep. I have sympathy for the uh, the, and this is the reason I bring this up is this is kind of another facet of the same argument, which is how do you do this? Do you allow all speech, and and you know let God sort it out? Uh, do you prohibit? Do you attempt to lock it down to protect everybody, or is there some middle ground? And I don't know if any of those solutions. Oh work this, this is one of those places where i i feel like i've got like a like a pet peeve about people who cry <laughs> censorship at a lot of these things because you know people are like oh free speech everywhere and you can have all the speech you want and it doesn't matter you know and it's like well but these are businesses this is not the so like what right. we're talking about with this oh, it's, particular it's not illegal for cloudflare to block them or not exactly. block them yeah they can decide who they want to do business with yeah. people used to when i worked back in mac world you know people would complain on our forums all the time that censorship when like threads got shut down and whatever it's like whatever we're a, we're a business we get to choose it's only this is censorship if the state. government does it yeah. this exactly. is my exact so this is response with everybody this. complaining yes. about losing their twitter now. accounts i'm like yeah. you're not being yeah. censored <laughs> that's no, a business that's not, that's not what this is right this that's capitalism people that is what you Sign yeah. up for. That's this is business, the free market. Yeah, you never so, see this you know. with like. You know, we we never see this with like uh, uh, Cloudflare standing up for uh, this LGBTQ site that expresses extreme inclusiveness to an extent that bigots all over the world are so angry they're demanding Cloudflare drop it, even though the site is engaged in peaceful posting of articles about drag queens uh, reading at libraries and uh, people getting married around the world and the increase in inclusive, uh, non toxic environments. You're like you don't see Cloudflare flare out there because it's always violence it's always the right wing uh it's always you know fascism or flirting or way over the line although semitism kiwi farms was used to swat uh marjorie taylor green yeah i feel like equal opportunity i mean employers swatting there. anybody bad idea bh. i'll even yeah. this is like, my one chance i'll come for marjorie taylor green yeah. shouldn't be swatted bad. no one no, should be like, swatted why, no and it's fascinating because it's all these people, you know, this is where you get back into the whole um, uh, most terrorism seems to arise out of domestic terrorism as in domestic in the house. You find most of the people get involved in these kinds of efforts have trouble already that's well known. They are already they already commit or are victims of domestic partner or familial violence. And so you keep seeing these things writ large. So it's like they're, they find the weakest target, which right now is trans people remain a vulnerable target worldwide and they attack them. Them because they feel like they will get the most support from even people who otherwise would be negative. But then, you know, it's always about violence. So they go after Marjorie Taylor Greene for who knows what reason, totally unacceptable that they would do this, put her family at risk, whatever you think about her, obviously. Uh, but they don't have any discrimination. So you think, I always go back to that. Like they came for, you know, they, they come for one group first, but they're always going to come for another, another, another. And you're always going to yeah, be in one of those groups. It's the means that's the issue more than anything, right? It's not it's how they're going about it, right? I mean, I, I think about this too when I see stuff in the politics realm where people are like, oh, if this happens, there'll be violence in the street. And again, to Glenn's point, you never hear the people who are about <laughs> inclusiveness and diversity being like, oh, there'll be violence in the street if there's not inclusion and diversity. No, that's not how it works. So yeah, it's about the means of how you're going about. I have a, I have a friend who has actually been targeting by these kinds of people and it is truly horrific, the kind of things that, that they have done, you know, in order to try and, basically just shut these people up and harass them into silence like or for often for very little provocation at all other than they just feel like doing it so uh, yeah i i don't know i'm glad that cloudflare flare make this decision it's a shame it took them so long and it's you know not going to solve the problem but it's a step in the right direction the thing i've seen said which i think is is worth repeating is that um fr uh, freedom of speech freedom of expression is can be suppressed by people who are also engaging in freedom of expression. So when Cloudflare says we're about, you know, maximalist free speech, we don't want to suppress anybody because then governments come to us and tell us to take human rights groups off the uh, internet, which to me seems like a specious argument to begin with. Yeah. There's a bright light difference. You can make that groups <laughs> Yeah. Like if a group's advocating violence and doxing people and, send in, and involved in the coordination of harassment and abuse, that's quite different than a group saying uh, this government's committing you know human rights violations. But the fact is these groups that are commit uh, harassment are decreasing the amount of freedom of speech of other people. And I think there has to be a balance when you're dealing with extremists. You can say, like, 
people, some people are never going to like trans people. They're never like the concept that uh, Jewish people exist or whatever. And I, I mean, <laughs> I want to say I can live with that. I can't, I, I hope try to live with that, but it's like, I, um, I accept that people may have bigoted ideas or uh, terrible ideas that affect me and my family and my community, my country, whatever. I can accept that, but facilitating them to uh, coordinate activities that are intended to suppress speech and harm lives that is a very bright line, and I just it suppresses yeah. my ability, expresses everyone around me's ability to to be able to have their own uh, version of free speech. To Glenn's point, I, when I was in college, one of the jobs I had was during um, in subsequent years after I was a freshman, I was in an orientation group where we taught uh, incoming students about using all the tech systems at our school. Right, we said, "Here's how you use your email, whatever," and we went over uh, free speech, hate speech, and harassment. And this was in like 1999 and 2000. And we could, if I could teach hundreds of incoming freshmen the difference, then, you know, we can figure this out. It's, it seems so difficult, though, to know exactly where the line is drawn. Is that maybe, is violence where the line is drawn? I think I mean, violence is certainly one of the lines. I, yeah. I think that it also shouldn't be a terrible thing if you have a group of people where they are actively coordinating to harass others and you want to actively coordinate a group of people to say hey business that's making money from this group protecting them we think that's a bad business relationship you should be allowed to do that i think that's not a big deal and if cloudflare is deeply annoyed and frustrated by it so be it you're the one keeping this business relationship going the CEO was calling that bullying. The fact that people who are under the gun, being attacked, docs, forced from their homes, people committing uh, self-harm, that, that people standing up for them against Kiwi Farms and against Cloudflare's relationship was bullying. And that is bullying. I, dash, dash, dash. <laughs> yeah. Should I mean, libs of TikTok be banned? This is a big uh, controversy yes. on Twitter yes. right now. 1.3 million followers. Uh, it is not active actively inciting violence, although it paints uh, LBGTQ teachers of being pedophiles and groomers. Uh, I mean, I do think it's worth noting that libs of TikTok's content and specific uh, hyper-focus on children's hospitals that also treat trans children resulted in seemingly resulted in bomb threats being called yes. to yeah. children's I want hospitals. I concur with that. that. That's Boston Children's Hospital right down the, the street for me, basically, where yeah. I am. And uh, yeah, that's that's a big deal. That is a major hospital that does a lot of important work, including the kinds of things they're getting harassed for. And to, you know, call in a bomb threat on a hospital. I'm with, you but know, is, is, is Libs of TikTok, I mean, clear indication. Libs of TikTok says we 100 percent condemn any acts or threats of violence. Uh, they are not saying go bomb the hospitals, but uh, but it's plausible that you know. Will nobody rid me of this troublesome priest? Is still yeah. incitement to violence. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. I mean, that's a I great that's a, a close great look. reference there on that one, <laughs> yeah. Ben Fleischman. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I haven't taken a close look at their tweets as of late. The only tweet I happened to see last night was, I believe, the I'm forgetting the woman's name behind the account, but she had tweeted, "Oh, I'm prepared for." Twitter to suspend or block my account. And once they do, I'm going to sue Twitter and everybody there because they're censoring me and taking away my freedom to speech. And I'm like, that's not how any of this works, sweetie. Like you <laughs> losing your Twitter account is not a First Amendment violation. No. No, it's, it's, Twitter has not. New, Twitter has not banned them at this as of yeah. No, they suspended them. I think for they months, got but, one slap on the wrist for yeah. one tweet. Which, yeah. like everybody else in the world who's gotten one tweet flagged, you delete it and you move on. Right, like Jordan Peterson. It's a, 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 a such a <laughs> yeah. It's a difficult thing to uh, to know yeah. how to how to do it. It is not deplatforming somebody to kick them off of Twitter. I'm sorry. It's, uh, yeah. A brief aside, since you mentioned Jordan Peterson, though, I think one huh. of the funniest things is if you look back over all the different times that he's been suspended or something and been like, that's it. I'm done with Twitter. This platform is terrible and I refuse to you know, acknowledge this. Next time they try to suspend one of my tweets, I'm never going to delete it and come back. <laughs> he says that and then like Every time. 22 hours later, he's back. That man is addicted. He cannot I stop. Got, I got to say the point of joy I have right now is watching Alex Jones being raked over the coals over and over 
over and over again and all of his garbage mm -hmm. exposed and also the success and lack of success of so-called deplatforming, right? So Alex Jones lost his access to a number of platforms and yet he apparently continues to make tens of millions or, or more dollars a year from selling snake oil to people. Um, but it's been, it's been great to see that grimy underbelly, like fully the rock picked up and exposed to understand exactly the ecosystem and what the value is to people spreading misinformation and hatred. This stuff is so hard, though. I mean, I can't really blame Twitter for tr trying to thread this needle. Mm -hmm. I may disagree with what they've done in some cases and not in others, uh, but it's a hard thing. It is a very hard thing to do, and it's hard to know what the what the line is, right or yeah, wrong. But they also put they put themselves in that position, though, right? I mean, they. Yeah. They opened that can of worms by creating the product that they did. And if you, you know, to a certain degree, they are responsible for policing it in, in a responsible manner, right? Uh, so on the other one hand, yeah, there is some trickiness to this, but it's it's a problem that could be at least, if not solved, addressed by prioritizing it. And it always feels like they kind of want to throw up their hands and be like, oh, well, you know, there's nothing we can do. Right. You know, we don't we don't make the rules. And you're like, it's the, you the internet. The, <laughs> the main character of the day problem at, at Twitter, which has, I think, gone up and down at times, is, you know, nobody wants to be the main character of the day. That's your job in life. If you come, if you participate in social media, don't do it. I know some people who have become the main character of the day. It's not very enjoyable to them ever. Occasionally it's positive. On either early. side, on any side, uh, right? Any part of it, right? Yeah. And so Twitter has built a machine that creates main characters of the day, sometimes multiple ones. And the issue is uh, a right wing. Uh, accounts typically, but sources uh, accounts that want to encourage uh, harassment up to the point of violence and, and real harm, they have figured out how to leverage the Twitter main figure of the day uh, algorithmic feed so that they can cause harm by fluttering butterfly wings, right? So they can say something that isn't directly, uh, doesn't uh, meet any kind of First Amendment test even of imminent harm and doesn't meet Twitter's direct tests about incitement to violence or commitment of hatred of speech, but they, or hate speech, but they uh, they surface up these accounts like libs of TikTok, for, uh, surface up people who are absolutely innocuous and make them the the uh, thirty what is it the uh, five minute hate figure? What's it yeah. from nineteen eighty four? Uh, and yeah. everybody in the world who is of that ilk gets that amplified out to them through the mechanism of Twitter and then other subsidiary mechanisms. Um, and that person becomes a subject of this for no there's no reason it should happen. It's a failure of the network that that happens. I want to take a break when we come back. He used AI to win a fine arts competition. Was it cheating? This is going to be a fun conversation. Uh, a great panel. You guys, I love this. This is going to be a long one, I can tell, because I don't ever want to stop when we have people like uh, Dan Morin here from SixColors.com, uh, uh, Glenn Fleischman of GlennF.com. Glenn.fun, I'm sorry. Glenn. I can't, I don't, my F key's broken, so I, I can only go to Glenn.un. Could you? <laughs> I'll uh, register that to me. Yeah, would you please? I've been on Glenn. I'll, 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 I'll join the United Nations. So I can, uh... I don't, you know, it's just, it's falling off. And uh, somebody who lost her slash uh, and question mark key, but survived, Paris Martineau. Reporter for Listen, the Listen, you know, I learned to ask fewer questions, and I think that's all right. <laughs> and go to fewer websites. Our show <laughs> yeah, all my websites are insecure now. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no slash slash. Uh, our show today brought to you by Podium. If you own a small business, it's you know, congratulations. You're still you're still running. It's been tough. A tough few years. From supply chain issues, increased demand, business owners have to manage. The businesses that are thriving right now are the ones who are forward thinking, and that's why I love Podium. Po I, uh, you know, there are a number of uh, businesses in our area that use Podium, and when I love it, I'll leave the my dentist, and they, uh, as I'm leaving, I get a text message saying, "Hey, don't forget your appointment is uh, coming up in six weeks or whatever," and uh, or maybe would you like to leave a review on Yelp or uh, you know that kind of thing. Podium. Helps your small business stay ahead of the curve with modern messaging tools that make it easy for your customers to connect with your business. And we have this one thing we learned during the pandemic. No one wants to make a phone call. Texting is it. A lot of people hate calling a business. I don't care if it's a plumber, a landscaper. I hate playing phone tag. If if I could just send a quick text message and get a text message back, I know that's, that's the way to do it. Well, that's what Podium does. 
If you're running a business and the only way to get in touch with you is a phone number attached to an answering machine or a service, you're probably losing customers. Podium gives businesses the tools to compete with the convenience that, you know, big businesses have known about for a long time. From healthcare providers to plumbers, over 100,000 businesses are texting with customers through Podium. And, and by the way, not only do customers love it, you will love the results. One car dealer sold a truck in just four text messages. A jeweler sold a ring and coordinated curbside pickup, did it all through texts. And the customers love it. A dentist had, had a bunch of outstanding payments. He'd been sending a mail, you know, trying to get... He sent out payment requests through text, got 70% of the outstanding collections in just two weeks because it works I don't remember, but the open rate, I think, on text is well over 90%. It's the, it's the number one way to reach people because it's effective. With Podium's all-in-one inbox, your employees will love it, too. It all goes into the inbox, and you could do more than just chat. You can get online reviews by sending an easy-to-use link. You can collect payments, send marketing campaigns. I get, and I'm ashamed to say it really works, I get our local ice cream parlor Every few weeks, I'll get something saying, hey, we haven't seen you in a while. How about 30% off a pint? And it works, gosh darn it, every single time. All by a quick text. Your employees can stay in touch with customers in one unified inbox. See how Podium can grow your business. Watch a demo today. You just go to podium.com slash twit. P-O-D-I-U-M dot com slash twit. If, you're, if you want to know more, you can learn. The facts are there. And I think you probably, if you think about it, already know this is how... Your customers want to do business. Why don't you do it that way, too? Podium.com slash twit. Podium. Let's grow. The ultimate text messaging platform. We thank them so much for supporting This Week in Tech. Uh, he, <laughs> I loved this story, but it's actually kind of a, a deeper uh, question. He won a fine arts competition, but was it cheating? This is uh, a... Uh, Colorado State Fair digital digital category the the digitally manipulated photography category uh, Jason Allen won beating twenty other artists blue ribbon three hundred dollar prize with an artwork he created through Mid Journey which is one of the new uh, generative art tools that are just taking off somebody said it's a Cambrian explosion of <laughs> AI art and I think that may be may be accurate um, the portrait beautiful portrait. Uh, looked like Renaissance art, although if I when I look at it, I can tell that that's 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 AI generated. I mean, that's not that's clear to me. But maybe the judges didn't have as much experience with this stuff. Is it fair to? I mean, he says, "Well, I wrote the prompt," <laughs> and then he imported it in Photoshop and what? fixed it up a little bit. So. What category is it in? Was it in like painting? No, no, like, no. Normally they have a digitally specific... manipulated photography. Okay, then that's fair. I, heard you know? argue with I that. mean, that is exactly <laughs> what it is. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, I think rules. if you're talking about high art um, or experimental art, using an AI to make a weird painting that kind of looks like a computer made it, that is art in and of itself. Uh, and if if right. the judges don't know and they still look at it as just a work <laughs> itself and are like, yeah, that's great. We love that. If they didn't know it was AI, I don't know. It's hard to, I, t I find it hard to ding them on that. Even, even as someone who, you know, writes creatively and I feel like if an AI wrote a book and that book won a competition, Ooh. I would be probably a little miffed, but I also don't know that that would just probably make me a hypocrite. Then, Like you got to hand it to it. Like if it's some like, of the I, AI I, made a, a better book, book it's or a good art, book, you're like, right? well, like, yeah, I don't I know. Screwed I, up. I, uh, <laughs> I, I have a degree in art. doesn't make me uh, better informed on this, but I studied a lot of art history as part of that degree. And one of the courses uh, looked at the concept of connoisseurship, which is how art is evaluated for its quality, right? So both by like, you know, for a price, but also how do you evaluate pieces of art and say this is better or worse, or this is a masterwork and so forth. And um, I think that this actually gets into that, you know, very abstruse little thing like connoisseurship is that there are you know this whole thing about kitsch right kitsch was a concept developed developed by uh clement greenberg like i don't know i think 80 years ago to describe art that was um uh, pre-digested you looked at it and it required no interpretation he was talking about uh, soviet art and other art that was super pedagogical and designed to 
just be the kind of you know pabulum to the masses. You looked at it, it's like this is the message, right? And that um, the opposite of kitsch is something that requires you know this interpretation. You look at it, and there's a perception. And it was you know Jackson Pollock and all the people doing abstract impressionism, Dadaism before it, surrealism, and then uh, a, a pop art and later movements. They all rely on this impression that art is something beyond just looking at a thing and saying that's a picture of a cake, right? So I'm sorry to get so deep into art history stuff here, but it applies because you're like, on what basis do the judges evaluate this? Are the components that they evaluated as being winning work uh, ones where they were mistaken things that they should have actually been looking at it more carefully, or is it justified? Does this work actually because of the sources on which it derives and how the algorithm has recombined it? Does it make it justifiably something that you can compare and use that kind of stewardship to say this is actually equivalent to other work uh, of this cal uh, caliber? Or is it just prettier? Is it prettier? I will say we do need to see what the other uh, art <laughs> works competing work because maybe they all really sucked. <laughs> We're not considering that. Um, yeah. Two, if we're con if we're looking at this from an art history l perspective, I think AI generated art would be a very futurist like mm -hmm. piece. Like this is kind of what the early futurist movement, like around impressionism, was talking about, which is that you know art is not precious. Art can be fast. Art is like movement and technology. And if in this case, art is typing in a couple words in a screen. That's art, baby. I actually I mean, go beyond that. I think that the uh, skill involved in typing the prompt, because it isn't usually just a few words, it's usually elaborate and you often refine it, is a form of computer programming. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe the future of computer programming as we interact with machines, with AI, uh, you know, computer programming up to this point, you very specific. The computer is going to do exactly what you said, no more, no less. But this is now the new the new way of communicating with a computer. It's more of a conversation. I think that that's actually the new form of programming, and to, I think we're going to, to see it in a lot of areas. To me, I think the clearest indication that it you know is a valid form of art is that every new medium or style is always greeted with that question but is it art right, right. you know look you at know, the impressionists the they were the they were reviled right, right? they had to have their and own so, art show just to get show people their work if people are asking that question i think the answer is usually yes and so yeah i mean it's not what okay, you that's expect that's not art whatever it was just in the <laughs> everything else it's, here, here I, is I never the, want to see the that prompt again. the prompt for it is <laughs> A still oh, no. of Donald Trump and Alex Jones in jail, photograph, natural light, sharp, detailed face, magazine, press, photo, Steve McCurry, oh David Lazar, Canon, Nikon, focus. These prompts, I mean, pick one you like. Can here. we this, uh, can we put a Leo-themed prompt in here? Yeah. Is that uh, I did search for my name. This is the new This is the new Google search, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Was that your first search? Yeah, one of my first. <laughs> so this is... Uh, it's like this Leonard is, Cohen in the upper left corner there. Yeah. Well, this is a search engine. This is Cohen. a search engine that searches stable diffusion. Stable diffusion oh, is responsible for a lot of this Cambrian explosion over the last two weeks. It's an open source generator mm. that's been uh, made available to anybody. You can install it if you have enough horsepower, big enough GPU, and run it yourself. There is uh, there are a lot of nuances to this story. A lot of facets to this story. One of the problems with stable diffusion, according to some, is it uses. A lot of images, we'll talk about this later, that are not in the public domain as its training material. Uh, and yet, because people can play with it, it's we've seen a lot of progress in the stuff we can generate. Um, how about, I'll just do Adam Driver. How about that? Because they're more of him. A, uh, a clear one-to-one -one for you. Yeah, yeah. Then, yeah, me and Adam Driver. So these, these are all... Uh, images that include that. Pr now, one thing Stable Something. Diffusion does is it will Ooh, show... Oh, there's some Nazi iconography. Yeah, I was going to say there's some... Good. Excellent. This, well one, this one is a portrait of John Oliver standing next to Adam Driver's stoic, full-body military oh, uniform. that's weird. Fantasy, intricate, delicate. Like John Oliver did an excellent segment, by the way, recently he on did. marrying a cabbage. He did, that was and he married a cabbage. In it fact, was beautiful. Yeah, in fact, if I search for John Oliver, I'll find a lot more 
of his he uh, material. A and it looks he's like really him. just Adam Auto Driver. Yeah. Adam Driver, yeah. <laughs> it's all Adam Driver. <laughs> That's why I never thought about that, but well, yes. John and Adam have a history, I guess. But uh, they do. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of John Adam. Oh, that's John. right. They have yeah, that. Uh, yeah. about that oh, thing. there's a lot of him, co John Oliver, covered in blood in a way yeah. that I would not have expected. Well, that came from, uh, he did a lot of searches, I think, in preparation. Well, he was searching on people doing searches of him or, or uh, yeah. work about him. Yeah. And then found the one in which he married a, married a cabbage. Highly recommend uh, watching that uh, segment that from the last Sunday's. Uh, oh, God. That one over, over the there. right is terrifying. This one? Yeah. <laughs> yes. That is my actual nightmare. This is a facial <laughs> portrait of John Oliver looking at the camera, laughing like a maniac. Colorful background. Lighting like in the Blair Witch pro Project. His teeth look like corn. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't it's mention like the corn Joker teeth. and John Oliver had a baby. Yeah. yeah. Just, so hey, Dan, I do find this a classic... Sorry. There's a classic sci-fi story. I want to say it's by C.M. Cornbluth, but I may be wrong, in which a machine falls through from the future into like 1940s or 50s, and a guy finds it, and he discovers it produces art. He gives it limited inputs, and it produces beautiful work. And what he doesn't realize is he, he it's written in a language he doesn't understand, and so he sends off, it looks like Swedish, so he sends off an instruction manual that came with it to get it translated. As he's using it, he starts to make these contracts. He's getting gallery shows. It's all being produced by the machine. And what he finds out, he gets the translation back, and it's a form, the person's like, this looks a little like Swedish, but he's been pressing the delete button all the time. So as the last image comes out, it's basically empty, and it draws a circle. And I was like, it was a perfect... <laughs> It's a perfect story from 80 years ago or 70 years ago about this idea of like automated art from the future. But then you hit the wrong button and you're, you're done. It's all over. Uh, one uh, senior research scientist at Google actually is sounding an alarm. Negar Rostamzadeh says, can't believe stable diffusion is out there for public use and that's considered huh. okay. Wait, why? Google's been very careful, as has OpenAI, to limit access to some of these wow. engines. And apparently, some scientists think uh, you've released the Kraken <laughs> if, you've, <laughs> if you've released uh, AI. Um, I think what's I think what re is required uh, for the development of a lot of these things is kind of this tight loop of interaction and i think stable diffusion that's exactly what's happened it's getting better and better and it's more and more intriguing i just typed in bunny and i'm getting a, a lot of weird things i was going to say that's a uh, not but, safe for work search yeah, well, <laughs> oh, like. yeah well apparently uh portrait of taylor swift as lola bunny in space jam wow uh, <laughs> again another extra, sentence that i would not have expected to yeah end like extra that. Arms. Well, there's, a, there's a lot more uh, oh yeah there's that. a third arm extra. there's a third arm yeah you need a third arm i yeah. yeah i mean this is we're talking about day one earlier you know I've, always, I've, I've ridiculed bezos using that because you know they're not a startup anymore they want to pretend to be one and they're a multi-billion dollar day company two and, or day well, three at amazon here's yeah. joe yeah. biden wearing we are, bunny we are, ears <laughs> we are day one for a lot of ai stuff it's amazing how much utility we can get out of ai and it's still not very good by many measures like you know yeah. if you can it's i mean i think voice recognition has gotten pretty good but it still has a long way to go this is in the early days of being practical and it produces remarkable stuff the the bid journey stuff is can be incredible uh, chuck amazing. wendig the uh the uh sci-fi yeah. or sorry uh horror, horror author dan what do you call chuck wendig oh uh, he does or, uh, weird, weird multi-genre yeah. it's really interesting Enigma. guy great uh, yeah <laughs> and very funny guy and i think uh uh interesting user of technology and he is constantly publishing uh, instead of writing probably his mid journey queries onto Instagram. You're like, it's so beautiful. Sometimes it's hard for me to believe this could be any kind of amalgamation that it's not directly from a source. Here's some, uh, not, this that, is, not that image. Though. This is from <laughs> the mid journey community showcase. So these are, and this is another thing you, you it's uh, my mom always said, if uh, all good bakers leave many cakes on the windowsill that, uh -huh. uh, that, you know, if you're going <laughs> to, you throw out the bad ones, but if you're going to show it in a community so showcase, it's a success. And I would say these are stunning, these images. The first, like, 15 you scrolled through all looked like PlayStation 5, like, title <laughs> characters, basically. Yeah. Well, I, I, maybe those prompts. But, I mean, look at this. This looks like breathtaking Baroque beauty, blonde beauty, full head, oval it's Baroque, Baroque frame. Uh, not Baroque. It's not Baroque. Right. But you know what? It's more it's like something. a full head. It's, it's something. Here's a crescent moon covered in vines and roses. Art Nouveau. 
Um, I mean, if it can't get, bar- if it ain't baroque, don't fix it. I knew you were gonna go there. I just had to. Uh, I think. Yeah, some- I mean, you, if you if you follow communities of cartoonists and illustrators, uh, they're more freaked out than authors are. Maybe we're past being freaked out by it. I don't know uh, about well, automation. I, uh- yeah, I don't know. There's always something very tempting in this for me, too. As somebody who has very little, like, visual art skills whatsoever and has done some work with, like, you know, stock photos, making some book covers for stuff I'd self-published. I mean, the idea that you could generate art that would be not just a stock photo that you've sort of manipulated or worked with, like, I don't know, it's a, it's an attractive option because I there's no way in a million years that I would get the skills and develop them and have time to like sort of spend all the time it require to get to this point. Does it mean it's taking jobs away from like people I could be paying to do that? I don't know. That's an interesting question. It, question is, I think where it gets complicated. Oh, I, I was just saying, I think where it gets complicated is I've seen a lot of um, major media publications as of late come under fire for using like lead images and stories mm-hmm. that are generated mm-hmm. by mid journey or Dolly or something like that. When, it's like this is the sort of illustration that typically these publications yeah. are paying a couple dozen different uh, freelance artists any given week or month to create. Um, I think the Atlantic's uh, Charlie Warzel had recently gotten some hot water because he had he has a small budget for his newsletter, so he's already just using stock images That's rather this than image I'm illustrations. Right here, but he yeah. had used the most horrifying photo of Alex Jones at a newsstand generated, I think, by Mid Journey, um, and it was. <laughs> I mean, people were quite upset about it. Uh, were they upset because of the image or upset because it took the uh, took bread out of the mouth of some illustrator somewhere? I mean, I think that people seeing it without context saw it and they were like, oh, The Atlantic, a publication that has a lot of money and typically is going to be paying and working with illustrators, is using an artificial intelligence-powered system to create their lead artists. Like, if The Atlantic is doing it, what is stopping any other publication? I mean, I think this is a little bit of a different case because he had a follow-up newsletter where he explained, I just run my small newsletter and have a very limited budget. Um, But I do think that it begs some question when you're talking about larger publications. Does it devalue... Does it devalue yeah. the work too, right? Because if you know, if right. you are a freelance illustrator and you're like, "Well, here's my rate," and they're like, "Well, we could just go to an AI and plug in a few words oh. and get the." By the way, same thing for this, this is generated by Mid Journey, and the caption says it's by Mid Journey. Alex yes. Jones inside an American office under fluorescent lights, and uh, but also uh, I should point out, Mid Journey retains the right to these images if they're turning into oh. an NFT. It may <laughs> get a cut. <laughs> Yeah, so, NFT is the most popular thing. I, I, as a musician, I know told me the most horrifying thing, uh, horrifying phrase I've ever heard about creativity a few years ago. She said, "I'm competing against all music ever published now," and I think that might be what terrifies artists, and rightly so. As a writer, I'm slightly terrified uh, because I don't. It's funny. I don't. It's not like it's easier to do art, but it's harder to get a corpus to produce, say, a news article or analysis of a contemporary thing or even a description of something um, because the, you have to have a deep corpus. But with art, the corpus is all art ever created. And so every time a, a rabbit appears in anything, that could be fodder for an AI to use. So it's it's really the sheer amount, right? It's the training set. So I don't think someone's going to write an article about... Uh, I don't think an AI could write a feasibly credible article now or in the next few years about an a person entering an AI generated piece of art <laughs> in, to a contest of winning. I don't know, Glenn. I, I've seen some, they've had those, there were those ones, I can't remember what the library was, but what was the, there was a thing recently where it would generate a story if you, in, in the same sort of way. You'd be like, tell, write a story in this way. I know because our pal Lex Friedman did it, like, oh, write a description of this podcast. Uh-huh. You know, and, and it was, uh, you know, surprisingly good. Again, and I think the, but, the but biggest full length. Could you write a feature that? Uh, way, yeah, though? I don't That's know. I, thing, I think right? I mean, not now, maybe, but I wouldn't discount it for the future. And I think the, like, the biggest uh, challenge with right. this is is this argument? Only argument thing we have. Is this <laughs> argument argue ultimately moot because it's like, well, the the genie's out of the bottle. Like once it's out yeah. there, 
you can't stop it. It's done. So yeah, it comes down to rights. It's like the source material, the training set to me becomes the uh, issue. We were talking about that on this very podcast with Christina Warren, uh, and who, who couldn't talk about it because she works for Microsoft and um, the uh, <laughs> co-pilot uh, product um, some uh, weeks ago, because that's the same thing is like who, if, if there are public, yeah. you know, this art isn't even public, right? Some of it is art that's copyrighted, but it was. So uh, Andy Bio did a very mm -hmm. interesting oh, yes. study. He, uh, this is uh, waxy.org. He uh, stable to, unlike uh, Dolly 2, uh, OpenAI does not release the training set. So we can't see where that came from. Because Stable Diffusion is open source, you know where it came from, where the training set came from. He says, we indexed the 12 million images in a sample. By the way, there are many, many more images. They, you know, they didn't want to go through 2.3 billion images. So they took a subset, 12 million images, and they indexed them. Uh, by domain, half the images were sourced from only 100 domains, domains, and the largest number of images came from Pinterest. 8.5% mm. mm. of the total data set uh, scraped from Pinterest. So completely disregarding uh, you know, copyright or ownership. Um, Fine Art America, second biggest domain, which sells art prints and posters. Uh, uh, 244,000 from Shopify, then Wix and Squarespace, Redbubble. So it's scraped images all over the net. Uh, number one artist of the top 25 artists huh. in the data set, only three are still living. Phil Koch, Aaron Hansen, and Steve Henderson. The most frequent artist, who would you guess? Thomas huh. Kincaid. Of course. The, 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 the painter of light trademark. Well, and it depends to a certain degree, like, how does this, I, I, you know, again, I don't know enough about the technology of this one to know how that works in terms of ingesting that material. I mean, one argues that if you are an artist, you have gone and looked at a lot of art and you have True. that art. As You've done the same thing. Yeah. Good yeah. point. Like, so, but, you know, are you, as long as you're not storing those, if you're just sort of exposing the AI to that and it's deriving its own conclusions... I don't know. That seems legit to me, but maybe I'm not taking everything into consideration here. Yeah. It's the same this thing we're talking about with Copilot. Should, same thing with JavaScript. Yeah. This is why we should legally ban every artist who has a photographic memory from looking at any art. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, this is a story uh, Harrison Bergeron, right? The uh, Kurt Vonnegut yes. story about someone who <laughs> is, um, you know, the society in which everyone has to be equal, but they define equal by disabling people who are too good instead of raising up everybody to the same level. And so Harrison Bergeron is the most beautiful, capable, intelligent, agile person. And so he has to walk around wearing like 300 pounds of weights and disfigure masks and so forth and um that that is it does get you to those fields where you're like well the ai should be blind it must be blinded because it can see too much beauty. for some reason when you described that i thought you know someone would make a good point and you just club them in the knee you know <laughs> disable them immediately <laughs> like just chop off an arm you were too smart in that meeting sorry gotta take down a peg andy uh, did an interesting thing he gave a prompt, the same prompt to Dolly 2 and Stable Diffusion on the left, realistic 3D rendering of Mickey Mouse working on a vintage computer doing his taxes. <laughs> and you can see that the one on the left, the Dolly 2 image, doesn't know who Mickey Mouse is. It's just a, a, a mouse. That's the original Mickey Mouse. That, like, maybe that's what it used to look like. White tank top, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty, wife beater. Uh, that's, that's what he had on before. You know, when he goes off for the day, you know, when he goes to relax, maybe the, that's what he looks like. Mickey yeah, Mouse, mouse after hours. Ripped. But yeah. yeah, but in stable diffusion, out there. it I knows who Mickey Mouse is because it's trained on Mickey Mouse, and so well, that it, that alone is going to get them into trouble, right? Because yeah, then Disney oh, comes man. saying, "Hey, yeah, you got to pay up for that. That's our that's our property." Yeah, it's it's uh, so that does raise an issue. Then there's also the issue of uh, AI generated pornography, and a number of publications have started to point out there may be more of this appearing. Uh, stable diffusion team a predict, built a predictor for adult material, assigned every image, and S. <laughs> this must have been a fun project. An NSFW probability score ranging from zero to one. So, uh, about two point nine percent of the English language images were unsafe, but it's uh, so so. There's def definitely a hardcore content. Leo, I've, we've wrapped around back to that first story. Here's the solution yeah. to all that age verification. Everything on the internet is produced by AI. It's tagged oh, yeah. as to how unsafe it is. Ah. And then you can 
all the content. There you nice. go. There we go. Perfect. Solved. I, yeah. I, in I the future, just... the internet ha- doesn't have any idea about Mickey Mouse, and I think that's beautiful. I, <laughs> I, think, I think the future is a fax machine which feeds into a shredder. That's my future. <laughs> oh, that's so it's great. So AIs, AIs consuming content generated by AIs. We don't need to be involved. Yeah, we just take a, take a break, go to the beach, relax. Right, let them do their work. Uh, good, good, good research from uh, a- Andy Bio, and um, I'm not That's sure what it is. concludes. Uh, I, I, you know, there's a lot of copyright violation. That's, uh, and there's certainly a lot of cribbing from existing art. I still think, though, that this is it's interesting because we've seen it's been such a stop and start thing. AI, there's you know been several AI winters already. Uh, we've seen how difficult it is to get cars to drive safely, to get voice assistants to answer intelligently. And yet, I think in this one area, AI has made huge amount, a huge amount of progress very quickly. Or is that just my imagination? We we fill in details visually better, right? We ah. see things that aren't, aren't there. And, you know, if, if 10 words in a row are misspelled, we're going to notice that. Or if the sentence doesn't make sense, Good it has point. to make logical sense. But we look at, like, the Mickey Mouse one on the right there. It's, you know, Mickey's hand has two fingers and it's distorted and the keyboard doesn't have all the keys. And that's okay. We don't notice that as much. You're right? like, he's doing it's his taxes. Kinda... I get it. <laughs> he's doing his taxes. Yeah. It's a Mickey on the left. The Mickey on the left is using a external clickety clack keyboard on what looks like a typewriter. <laughs> There's yeah. paper doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, great. Well, but yet a... we're like the mouse is ripped and, and doing his taxes. And I think I that's it. actually Dark. Paris your keyboard because it looks like it's missing the uh, question mark. That's true. Yeah, you know, know. he's like just to, a like very the, serious mouse. <laughs> I'd like to know if the rear end next to you is AI generated that appeared during the break. That's my question. Uh, could be. <laughs> Could be. I don't know. Suddenly, I realized. I noticed. All right. Yeah. Oh, that's the sequined. <laughs> I understand. That's that piece of art. This is the sequined described. mannequin butt. Yes, 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 yes. yes. I understand. Now. I okay. can't figure out which way to turn. Yes. I, you know, brought it in. Wow. They no, I that's understand. straight out of stable it's... diffusion. <laughs> Listen, wow. Man, this is the two percent. Uh, I'm typing that prompt in now. More on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm you well, made 3D, that. You 3D made printing that. plus. AI plus 3D printing, you'll type in oh, no. sequin mannequin butt, and then it'll come out of your device, and you'll have, you know, there you go. And you'll be like, you know, that you sequin know mannequin butt only has one butt cheek, but I get it. <laughs> Do you remember when like, there was the this fear over uh, uh, nanotechnology of, like, gray goo, everything would turn yes. to gray goo? Now I'm worried that yes. we're going to be a wash in 3D printed stuff generated by AI. It's just little plastic <laughs> yeah, goo oh everywhere God. that an AI has created. Oh my God. I it's think that's turn likely around. now. It's like a mouse with six arms. But you know, Mike take on a lot of like robotics and AI stuff, and I don't know if this is. I sometimes feel like I'm way off base, and sometimes I feel like I'm seeing it as a trend. Is augmentation right? We have more people, despite the pandemic, more people are now employed in America than there were before the pandemic. We've recovered from that. Employment continues ever upward, even as American productivity. Just to take you know us as an easy to find example, productivity continues on an unprecedented pace continuously for all American workers. Blah 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 right we have so much robotics now we have ai's engaged in a lot of aspects of daily life you know uh, i think dan i think you use this um, paris you may as well ai based uh, transcription for interviews and things like that at least as a first pass if not the verbatim one i, I love use this. trent you love it who? has uh, yeah i'm using uh, trent uh Trent, Trent, he's a great fellow that just listens to all of my interviews and kind of mashes some buttons. <laughs> it's a, really helpful. Oh, use, Trent um, with an I, yes. Trent, Trent with an I. It's a yes. really good transcript. Yes. Yes. It's I use not a, a guy named Otter. Trent. <laughs> I thought you loved Trent. Trent. I didn't know. Listen, I, I Trent. Otter.ai. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Otter is integrated with Otter's Zoom. Otter's another one. Yeah. Integrated with Zoom. And it made a huge difference in my reporting. It would it would sometimes take hours out of the work I was doing to have a searchable thing. So it was, this was substantial augmentation. My, you know, word rate or my hourly rate for articles I wrote essentially went up by playing, paying a, a relatively low yearly fee to have this AI assistant. So augmentation, my question is, and I think a lot of artists are thinking about this now, I mean, uh, people like web cartoonists and folks who do commercial art, the field had sh- has shrunk and it's a very complicated one already. Um, so the question is, does this become an augmentation where they can use this as a tool, as a visualization tool? Is it something that helps them get to where they're going 
faster for commercial work or, um, you know, as a writer, uh, do I wind up, uh, there's another science fiction story in which, you know, some writers like us are sitting there typing away and you have to control the AI from moving too fast ahead of you, but it's a partnership and it allows someone to produce more work that's more accurate and more quickly, maybe less creative or you're providing the creative component. So there is a future in which augmentation reduces less of the scut work and uh, produces a, a better impact. But again, you know, we have so much so much, uh, so many professions and fields have been roboticized, uh, or have had even tiny robots or other kinds of automation added in the last you know, 50 years, and yet employment, right? We're not uh, employing 50% fewer people. We're at all-time high employment in America. Yeah, in history. fact, <laughs> there's too many jobs for too few people. More so, robot uh, ro for hamburger flippers, right? Apparently. I think you I think you nailed it, though. I mean, honestly, the best self-driving cars are not driving entirely on their own they're not level four or five it's level two where a human it's human augmentation and that's why it's a mistake to call it autopilot but uh but that those kinds of you know self-driving vehicles are great they're not self-driving the they're assist they're computer assist and i think that works well Do, by the way trent uh is do you have you tried otter which is better uh, Paris, you like? Trent? I have been a Trent fan for many years. I find that Otter for me, I don't know. I know a lot of people who swear by Otter. Um, I found that it doesn't uh, often transcribe with the same level of accuracy. And most importantly for me, I think that Trent's, uh, that's T R I N T, not my friend Trent, um, <laughs> Trent's editor editing service is really perfect for the sort of things that I use transcription for. Yeah. Like once you uh, load up your transcription, you kind of have a uh, time coded, like live transcription of it that scrolls with the audio. And you can, whenever, let's say if there's a word that it got wrong, you go in to edit it and it pauses. And then once you're done editing, it restarts at the word right after. So I think it's like really good for the sort of workflow that I do, but you know, I know a lot of I, people I point enjoy out, Otter. Oh, I should point out there's another reason I discovered Otter was for uh, live captioning. And I should point out this is an incredible area in which it was almost impossible to get and now is widely available is you needed live people typing to do real-time transcription of conversations. Now, there are a billion conversations a day that can be transcribed or, or sorry, can have live captioning. You know, Google Skype does built an amazing in. job with uh, uh, Android 12 and 13. So, and Skype right. is incredible. Apple's yeah. adding it, and iOS uh, six. Yeah, Apple's. So, and that that is a. I mean, so 99.999% of all phone conversations, video conferences, and, and whatever did not have live captions. And now you have the potential, and I suspect it is a more than 10% number where people enable that. And that is, oh my God, the amount of cognitive um, energy that saves and the improvement in conversation. So not like I want to be a, a like, yeah, AI only has positive impacts, but I'm like, uh, my wife has hearing issues. Um, she can't drive at night. Like I see always, I look at AI and improve improvements in all these kinds of automations and robotics as tools for people, you know, directly near me where it's going to improve, it captions already improve her life and um, it, augmentation that would allow like night vision or other tools, it'll have to be full automated driving, could allow her to drive at night again safely. Yeah. Uh, Dolly 2 has announced uh, a new feature called Out Painting, which is oh, a kind yeah. of another way of taking a human generated product and then applying... <laughs> So I'll show you the time lapse oh of Vermeer's The Girl with the Pearl Earring. Uh, Dolly, too, is painting the room the girl's in. Oh, and it's, wow. I mean, it's not obviously probably not the real room, but it's pretty credible. Oh, it's weird. <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> uh, Did you whoa. see the example of someone? She was, uh, she's a fashion designer and technologist, and she created a video by combining out painting uh, and like two or three other tools to, to create seamless images. And um, it just shows her like walking down the street and her outfit is changing into AI generated alternatives as she walks. And it's, I oh, I did see that video. It's, it's phenomenal. Great. I can't yeah. remember. Yeah. And it, she cobbled to together that. a bunch of stuff. That Vermeer thing, though, I mean, it really makes the girl with the pearl earring look like a bit of a slob. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not, yeah, it's not yeah. very tidy. What is, is going on there? Yeah. It's yeah. like, do you need that many lemons on your shelf? Like, <laughs> yeah, put them in so the fridge. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the girl with the clutter problem. Maybe, maybe, maybe AI <laughs> has a problem. Maybe AI is a hoarder. Oh my god! Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. 
weird. How many lemons That's do you weird. need? AI? Lots of teacups up on that top shelf there. What is what's happening? <laughs> with some perspective issues too, with where those oh, see, you're right. shelves are angled. So now, so now I'm realizing. It's like, man, have you you got so many Amazon packages there in the bottom right? She's got to really take the recycling out. <laughs> now I'm realizing oh, that you were right, great. Glenn Fleischman. That we are filling in the details that make it feel better than it really is if you look closely. This is Vermeer by way of M.C. Escher. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of awful. It's kind of cool, though. Yeah, it's kind of like cool, kind of yeah. awful. That's that's the, that's the basically this looks the... looks kind of I-spy. And what's this thing we're hanging so, here? What is this? Is that a... We're just that's a light a, pole, right? It's a light... <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a okay. boom mic. It looks like a mouse <laughs> hanging by its yeah, tail. I don't, Vermeer uh, edited out. It was a goof, <laughs> and that's why Vermeer... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's actually under the goof section of IMDb. You know, That's right. Exactly. See it in the frame. What if AI would, would is this, like... If Vermeer like, had put, painted this, would we say, oh, what a beautiful painting. This is art. <laughs> I don't know. That is fascinating. To oh me. My I don't know. I feel like it was long enough ago, like... This is kind of impressive because it just like, man, you survived. This, you didn't get enough. You didn't die of illness in yeah, the time took 16, to paint this. Yeah, this took 16 yeah. years to paint. And I hope you got a good price yeah. for it. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, it's it's oh uh, man that's great. Do you think AI wow. might be slightly psychotic? Like uh, it's not conscious, so who knows? Has, hesitate to give a clinical diagnosis. To a piece of, a <laughs> yeah, of I don't know. We're not armchair. We don't want to armchair uh, okay. psychologist Fair AI enough. here. I'll, Fair I'll Georgia Dow and see if she'll. Uh, Here's an interesting application. Oh, AI therapy. That's going to be a growth industry. AI I think we started with that, Glenn. That was where Eliza came from. Yeah, oh, that yeah. was literally oh, Eliza. We're no. full circle. Oh my! No, no, but therapist for the AI, not therapist for <laughs> oh, us. Oh, the, the AI needs. Yeah, analysis. the AI is, is going to be mental... scrolling through TikTok, and it's going to tell the AI <laughs> you have, have ADHD done? and have got to get yeah. stimulants right now. Georgia um, Dow, therapist to AIs. That's going to be her <laughs> new podcast. Here, here is, I think, a very good use of AI. Storybooks.ai. They want to take all of the. Gutenberg project public domain text and illustrate it with AI. It's a fascinating idea. Is that an interesting idea? It's problematic yeah. in an entirely different way. Although what's weird is the original drawings of many of these works have uh, exist. Like many of these works right. were yeah. illustrated and they're not in copyright either. So, but it's it's an interesting exploration. Is that what Sherlock Holmes looks like? No, I don't, I don't like it. I don't, I don't like it. So. I don't like it one What is bit. going on with his jaw? Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> You've become AI critics, you guys. Let's see. Listen, you know. Uh, they are going to be therapy after. If they're producing the art, they better be okay with getting Philip criticized. Philip K. Dix, you know? do androids dream of electric sheep? That would be a natural for AI, right? There's that. I like Again, I like a book. very thick man. Rick Deckard. I like his book, uh, Rose Galactic, from the Bed. Uh, what is it called? Galactic... Uh, Pot shirt healer or something. It's one of his strangest works. Much better though. Philip K. Dick. I do ha yeah. think we have to try and analyze Lucky why Potter. AI is obsessed with making ripped arms. You know, like <laughs> all of the They're every all arm is jacked because it's been yeah. trained no on arms. Jeff Bezos images. That's why. That's oh true. But then the next one will be very long. Too. It has too no much. arms and it must it <laughs> must pump iron. A little too much. Uh, <laughs> oh, that makes you want to know a fun Maybe. fact? I've never been able to get in copy, Reference but I've heard from sources uh, since Jeff Bezos got on his fitness kick, you know, obviously to kind of go to space, he uh, started taking, he never would use the Am the elevators at Amazon's HQ this when is, he was CEO. He would always take the stairs up and down. And that meant, of course, due to the power, like politics, like internal politics dynamics of working amongst, like next to a CEO who's trying to get jacked, all of his underlings would also be like, oh, I got to take the stairs. Jeff is up there. I can't be seen in the elevator. And I think that's just very funny sometimes. You so worked like, at Amazon, man. didn't you, Glenn? You know that? Do you know the story? Yeah, I, uh, I think uh, I don't know if you did it at the time. We I worked I worked at Amazon when we were on the second and fourth floor of the oh, uh, so you don't know Columbia. <laughs> but yeah, I think he walked to the I think he walked to the fourth floor. I think his office is on the second floor. Wall he Street. had a rack of identical shirts behind him though. That's all I remember. Wall Street Journal article this weekend: Yachts and watches. The real CEO flex is washboard. <laughs> Abs, amazing. Uh, and uh, amazing. there's uh, there's the example. Oh there's, no, Elon Musk. There's the counter example. Elon Musk oh. getting getting uh, hosed down by uh, Ari Emanuel. Uh, I've never felt better about Elon Musk than seeing that. It makes me feel very sympathetic Listen, to him. Listen, we all want to believe in our hearts that we would be the Jeff Bezos physique if we were billionaires. <laughs> but really, a lot of us would be the Elon Musk physique. If you had the money. That's okay. Here's uh, here's from uh, Selling Sunset, the uh, Jeff Jason Oppenheim, the uh, 
the buff realtor. Jeff Bezos. Here's Jeff Bezos pulling a Putin. On a horse. I yeah. say, it was very Vladimir Putin looking. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Here is the video game. Oh, no, executive. that is too tight. <laughs> Stress. <laughs> oh. Zelnick. <laughs> AI I can, that out for me. If you can see Nip, that's too tight. <laughs> it's the Batman costume. It's the uh, I think the best for... part of that is says photo courtesy of Stress. All these layers, like, oh, you, give, <laughs> us your, give us your back picture. <laughs> yeah. they, we, the Wall Street Journal reached out and was like, hey, can we get a photo? We're doing this uh, one of the walkboard yeah. apps. He's like, where he shows nips. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I need to see your eight Boy. pack, sir. Mr. Zelnick, who favors twice daily workouts and says he exercises up to 12 times a week. Is not dad bodying it, and neither are friends like Mr. Emanuel, chief executive of media company Endeavor, the journal says. Oh, my God. On a recent visit to Mr. Emanuel's office in Beverly Hills, Mr. Zelnick said the executive took phone calls and wrote emails while walking at a treadmill desk. Mr. Emanuel, who did not walk during his actual meeting with Zelnick, did not comment. Oh, treadmill desk, nothing. You need to have like a rowing machine desk. (laughs) Yeah. All right. All right. I I have to say I'm a a little closer on the Elon to Ari scale. I'm a little closer to the Elon uh, side of that scale. But uh, that's the new thing. If you got the money, washboard abs. It's yeah, always, they're cheap. You uh, can order them on Amazon. Slap yeah. them right on. It's true, yeah. It, it costs a lot of money to look as good as people who have to do manual labor. <laughs> Are, yeah. I think probably, Paris, you're glad you didn't get assigned this story. <laughs> yeah that's an amazon you story know, you didn't really want to write not not really don't need to spend any more time uh mm-hmm. looking at the physiques of tech executives no. i think it's a little weird <laughs> yeah, a little creepy. A little creepy. hey let's take a little break fun panel today paris martineau from the information glenn fleischman from uh well glenn f Dot f- Glenn dot fun. I'm sorry, he's Glenn, Glenn F on fun. Twitter. You're gonna get it by the fourth ad break. I, you know, if I could just get this F key working here, I what the F? <laughs> why did it? F. Why the F key? Like, uh, did I? Did, was I pounding you hard got, on? Leo, you're you working got hard on ligatures. The top there. <laughs> what? You got ten more F keys right at the top. Oh, F fun thing. Yeah, oh. Just, oh. Oh. Key. just apply. Yeah, assign an F key to the F key. What happened yeah. here? My computer just uh, macro just, time just died. Uh, also, uh, that is of course Dan Morin, the author of the Galactic Cold War Saga. If we're all really nice to him, maybe nice. he will write another one soon. The uh, the Cambrian just... explosion was not one of your books, as no. I recall. That was no, no, was no not yet. Caledonian Gambit. Right, Caledonian <laughs> Gambit is not the Cambrian <laughs> explosion. Yeah. Our show today brought to you by ClickUp. Imagine in your five-day work week having one of those days off, right? One extra day a week. What would you do with the time? I'd be watching more reality TV. Maybe you'd cook healthy meals. Maybe you'd work out more, get that buff CEO bod. Or maybe like Dan, you'd write volume four of the Galactic Cold War. An extra day a week. Well, you can with ClickUp, the productivity platform that's so good, it'll save you a day a week on work guaranteed. ClickUp began with the premise that productivity was broken. There were too many tools to keep track of, too many things. And you siloed into completely separate ecosystems. There had to be a better way, a more productive way to get through the daily hustle. ClickUp does it. One tool to house all the tools you use, all your tasks, projects, all your docs and goals and spreadsheets and more. And it's, it, it's a great idea for any size team, even if it's a team of one, if it's just you, or for a, a thousand plus people packed with features and customization options no other productivity tool has. Out of the box, you'll be productive immediately, but you can also customize it to work the way you work best, whether you're in project management or engineering or sales or marketing or HR. Everybody gets an easy-to-use solution that creates a more efficient work environment. It's ClickUp. Join more than 800,000, 800,000 highly productive teams using ClickUp today. Our offer code, TWIT, will get you 15% off ClickUp's massive unlimited plan for a year. That means you can start reclaiming your time for under $5 a month. Sign up today at ClickUp.com. Use the code TWIT. But don't delay. This offer doesn't last forever. It's limited time. Thank you, ClickUp, for supporting Twit. 
ClickUp.com. And again, the offer code is TWIT. Thank you, ClickUp. Uh, well, Wednesday's a big day. Apple is... Uh, <laughs> I, I think there should be a new word for the Apple events. Uh, it's, it's a product launch, but it's also an infomercial... Um, is can we call it a launch commercial? I don't know. Is, is any product launch uh, not an infomercial, Leo? No. Well, actually, so. all of these are, aren't they? In fact, I'm kind of thinking: should we really be giving these the coverage that we do? But people want to know. People want to see it. Could call them eye candy. Yes. Oh, ooh, ooh, I get it. I think we should call them. Uh, should be an email. Could Maybe. <laughs> You know, that's a reporter talking. Can you just send me the talking points, please? Right. I will oh, say, really. uh, one of the happiest moments of my life is when I changed in the tech reporter world from having to sit at, like, two, three different computers paying attention during all the Apple releases to oh, not caring about it yeah. and just witnessing mm -hmm. it as a consumer. Did you ever have to do that, day. Dan, sit at the computer and transcribe the... Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. I live blogged a bunch of events, financial calls, which are always the best because everybody loves... Oh, yeah, now I'm here on calls. quarterly earnings. Oh, <laughs> this is, yep, done that a this lot. Is Tim. From one fire this is to Tim. another. Tim. This is Tim. This is Tim. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, will you be going, Dan, uh, to uh, the Apple campus uh, this week? No, week? with a with a six week old, I will not be going no. to the Apple campus. I, Jason this week. doesn't seem like the Apple Jason's execs will be going either, right? Yep. Last time well, they were just be there camera. via video, right? I was there. I was there in June, um, which was an interesting experience. And I know uh, Jason will be there, and uh, Leo, your pal and mine, Micah Sargent, I believe, will be there as yep. well. Oh. Yep. Uh, so that's very exciting. Leaving me in the lurch all alone, sitting here, <gasps> oh, snarking bro. during the uh, infomercial. But that's all right. That's that's the job I chose. Um, this It's interesting because the invite said Steve Jobs Theater. So the event yeah. you went to in June was outside with a big Correct. screen. Was, and yeah. Well, yeah, you could sit outside or it was partially in the the the. the, the Cafe, the ring, right? Yeah, yeah, the Cafe Max in the ring. Yeah, yeah. so we were in just indoors for that, but it was like open air. Uh, but yeah, the Steve Jobs Theater definitely suggests a more uh, traditional presentation than what we saw in June. And so, yet, uh, calling it the rings makes it sound like Tim Cook is going to fight someone. <laughs> it's like the Octagon: Tim Cook versus Jeff Tim Bezos. Cook. Yes. He's yeah. got some washboard abs. I okay, bet you, so he, I bet you. I, yeah. Now we've Tim never seen uh, Tim's uh, Tim nipples, but I have a feeling he probably does have a six pack under there. Every story about oh, Tim this is reminds about me. Out. This, this does remind me of the time I got a call from a reporter asking about Jeff Bezos' private parts, and I'm glad that story never ran. Oh, I remember that. Was it National oh. Thank you, Mr. Pecker. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Mr. Yeah, Pecker. Jesus. Aptly named the uh, head of the National Enquirer. I, I did do that interview, and then I was like, maybe I don't need to be talking about Jeff Bezos' private parts. Oh. Not from personal You knowledge. know what? Jeff called their bluff. He said, go ahead. I, I will say, that was listen, that was the one of the best PR moves I have seen in Amazing. a long time. Like, yeah. is taking what should have been a moment of weakness and somehow spinning it into, no, I'm going to drop all the receipts and then also make a couple of, like, puns. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was, of course, going back to uh, when the National Enquirer came, claimed, and I think they got it from his girlfriend's brother, which was really that's yeah, right. shameful. Well, that's, was it? Oh, yeah. Text, text know, guess, messages. It proven? Huh? I don't know. There, there's, I wasn't sure if it was proven. Was it proven? I think it was pretty strongly the correlation. Was I, there, right? I believe there was litigation. I'm not sure yeah. as to how that shook out, though. Uh, eesh, very icky, very squirmy. Yeah, uh, the whole thing. But that's called, uh, wh what do they call that in PR, where you take the lead on a story? You you get ahead of the story. He got ahead. He got way ahead of the story. Way ahead of that <laughs> he story. He got so far ahead of the story that uh, it was like, well, we can't publish these now. They'll just, <laughs> just ruin Instead it. Instead of like leaning into a crash, he caused like mm. a different crash. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but it somehow him. ended up okay. <laughs> good for him. He's, uh, I guess, doing all right. Anyway, back to Apple. <laughs> Sorry. Doing all right, this is what I Jeff do. Bezos. He's story. doing all right. Yeah, he's, he's okay. whatever happened to him? Is he happy? He's he's really back happy? together. What a what a rough time he's had. He's just going to space whenever he feels going like it. Wearing a cowboy Yahoo. hat, take driving some helicopters. You know, doing okay. Billionaires in space. That's a that's a story from a few months. Capitalist ago. pigs in space. I think you meant more like. 
Uh, <laughs> somebody in the chat room says, I don't know, you just said the same thing. Yeah. Doing all right, the Jeff Bezos story. <laughs> I think you're right. That could be the name. Uh, Apple's pro product products will steal the show at the iPhone 14 launch event, says Mark. A uh, German. Uh, one of the things I'm a little uh, interested in the rumor that the new Apple Watch Pro, a kind of mm. bigger, heftier sport model, will cost as much as nine hundred dollars. It's still not the most expensive Apple Watch ever made by a long shot. Yes, <laughs> right. Yes. I mean, this yeah. thing slowly come down. Short of that. yeah, they've yeah. come down over the years. So nine hundred bucks is a price point. I feel like is a pretty pretty reasonable ask plus i mean you know apple always tried to position those watches as a fashion accessory if you know anybody who's like really into watches you spend way more than 900 dollars. yeah on really but that was so, johnny's folly the the apple watch solid i won't gold disagree edition. with that uh but, i feel like with johnny gone it's a little tone deaf uh to say we're gonna make a 900 dollar apple watch don't well, the question is, what what is this? What is the story Apple's going to tell about why is this watch better than the watches we already have? What makes this a pro watch? Is it just that it's bigger? Is there something else going on here? Right. Uh, you know, I think. What could they do to make it worth that much? I that's a great question. They'll I think tell you exactly the time they'll, that you'll tell die. you. <laughs> <laughs> How much time you have left? It's right. a theme. Uh, yeah, yeah it's episode. just a countdown a clock. Counting down. Why is this watch going backwards? This seems, <laughs> this seems ominous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> German does know. does remind us that you know you can get a solar powered uh, Garmin watch for and that's thirteen hundred dollars. So it's not unheard of in no, these high end sport watches to spend I, a significant amount of money. I think Mark made the point as well that it's just uh, some of this is Apple's way of saying we don't want to seed that portion of the market. We are right. you know we are a premium product brand, so therefore if we can be charging people more and they will pay it, then we should be doing that. Yeah, yeah. Apple holds 36% of the smartwatch market. I would have thought it would be a bigger percentage. That's according to CounterPoint research. Yeah, that's actually surprising. Yeah. Garmin that is the market Garmin. share leader yeah. for watches over 100 bucks. So Garmin is, I think you're right, got a target on its back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, My thought is, I, I mean, obviously this is incredibly speculative, but I... I feel like there's always been people talking about how Apple could at one point buy Peloton. And I think that would be the thing that would really jumpstart their watch business if they kind of sold it as a tie in to some sort of exercise based platform in a way that kind of broadened all the aspects of their fitness ecosystem, as well as Apple Music. It could, I think, really kind of bring about an interesting flywheel effect. Probably they won't do it because Peloton's a big flaming trash fire, but... Well, it makes it cheaper, well, right? And That's true. Fitness, Fitness Plus is already doing a lot of that for them. I mean, they already have watch yeah. integration with that and... It is played with, yeah, I believe, Life Apple Fitness. Music yeah. and all that stuff, too. Yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't know what Peloton would get them other than just scooping up Hardware, a lot of talent. Hardware, yeah. Yeah, and I Apple don't think they want... Apple could just buy all the Peloton... Yeah. Bikes. Yeah. yeah. Apple could just buy all the Pelotons used. They're so cheap now. Just buy a bunch of Peloton. Uh, Peloton has announced That's that they're going to start selling their bikes in Amazon, and oh, they're yeah. going to stop doing the uh, white glove install service. Right. I, I think Peloton's angling to get bought by Amazon, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, okay, my thought, though, is once they start selling these bikes on Amazon, they're going to have a nightmare on their hands because the delivery of Peloton bikes is very complicated. Yes. The bikes are very fragile. I know this because I have one. I do too. And, somehow and they're heavy when it was as delivered, yeah. it oh, yeah. broke immediately. <laughs> and it ooh, was just that ooh. one wire was slightly pulled the wrong oh. way. And it literally took like multiple different technicians coming out. They had to replace oh each gosh. piece of the bike fully from the ground up. Then another person moved it once when they were replacing one other part of it and they had to do it all over again. I mean, if you you have an average Amazon delivery person somehow now trucking in your Peloton bike, it's going to blow apart. It's going to turn to dust. How many hundreds of pounds does it weigh? Also, am I exaggerating? It's a very, it's heavy. It's not hundreds, it? so but it might but be a hundred. I mean, that's it might that's be a hundred. That flywheel that's, has to have a lot of weight. That's that's what you're moving when you yeah. pedal. 
So it has to yeah. be heavy. That's a hard box to get into a lot of places without some. Uh, I agree. You couldn't help. get it nobody, up three nobody flights. Nobody really makes light exercise equipment. I want to say this is somebody <laughs> help people move weights a lot. Like these are just designed to be yeah. heavy. That is all they do. You know. Wait a minute. Yeah. That's a hot category. Light yeah. exercise equipment. Huh? I <laughs> like it. <laughs> if this were Shark Tank, I'd give you some money. Uh, there's some extra, there's some extra size stuff you can fill with water later, and then it gets oh, heavy that's because not good. water. No, 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 that's, no, that's silly. That's, that's like how you lifting get milk jugs. Yeah. yeah. Hey, no, water's water's. Wait, what's wrong with what's wrong with water? What do <laughs> yeah. you got? What are you, Rocky? Water? Listen, I don't know. Then, yeah, come I've on. I've heard that every person who's drank water has died, so I'm going to stay away. <laughs> this is, uh, this dihydrogen is the darkest monoxide ever. strikes again. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, there's a co there's a common thread that no one's talking about, That's and it's a water. Very good point. Water. New Wi-Fi <laughs> data shows <What>? that <laughs> I know that Peloton <laughs> right, the data streamed to at home fitness bikes was down 23 percent in the first half of 2022. That's interesting. We're all leaving the house mm -hmm. again. We're going back to the gym, maybe, huh? Fitness bikes, the single biggest contraction, followed by Blu-ray players, iPods, iPods, and similar devices. <laughs> I don't think that. Ah, uh, the iPod. <laughs> iPods. Uh, iPod. iPod. iPods. Yeah. Just media players was the whole category. <laughs> Declined 14%. P this is the data streaming via Wi-Fi. This comes when, from Plume. When do, do Blu-ray players stream Wi-Fi? They don't have a no. That doesn't make any sense. Some of them I, do streaming. Some of them are streaming boxes. Media, let's just say media yeah, players. Weird. Media I guess. players. <laughs> We're picking the sentence apart, Leo. I'm sorry. <laughs> just, I didn't write this. We're yeah. coming for you. Oh, Yanko Rutgers now, wrote this on protocol. Who's watching these Blu-rays? Yeah. Let's talk yeah. Yanko, but, and then I'm PCs were I'm down seven percent year over year. This is because Plume, which makes those little pods that uh, Comcast uses, a number of companies also use for their uh, mesh Wi-Fi. Of course, you can buy them uh, directly. Smart TVs, data consumption increased by 34%. Smart speakers, and I think I'm mostly responsible for this, up 27%. I was going to say, you have 18 in every, in every room in your house. And they're all sending every conversation, of course. So up 27%. Every cough, every shower you take. I'm now highly like, concerned I'm about this. This plume group here, this data. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, plume is just selling data left and right. Much, this is no. not well, okay. it's, a, it's anonymized. They're in the house of every person that owns an iPod still. Yeah, you yeah, know? It's anonymized. <laughs> yeah, all the iPods. That might be a yeah. non representative sample, honestly, if they're all the yeah. <laughs> iPods and Blu ray players. I, I, think it's, I think it's media things, and they broke it down to Blu ray players, iPods, and similar devices, but I think media players I think it's, shouldn't leave I with think Blu ray it's streamers. Players. I think it's Apple <laughs> TV. Streaming and all that stuff. Roku, yeah, Roku's, Apple TV's. Yeah. Ro I hope Rokai. it is. I hope. I will it is. say this is a unpopular opinion, but I want my TVs to be dumb. I still have yeah, oh, yeah. TVs that's that that's not I bought unpopular. like five. No. I, I, I bought my TV smart. like five years ago, and I'm like, I don't want you to connect to the internet. No. I'll, I'll plug my Roku in and out as yes. I see fit, and nothing more. Exactly. We got a smart. We got a smart TV. We because we wanted a bigger TV during pandemic. We were like, oh, let's get a bigger TV. We're watching it more. Needs something to watch, and so we did, and I got a. A Vizio, and uh, what well, the great part is, not only that it's it's smart, and that I have to deal with its stuff. Is at some point in the last few months, it developed this new uh, firmware update that I can't figure out how to control. Where when the video source uh, gets turned off, like the Apple TV, if the HDMI what is it called, HDMI CEC thing doesn't work and your TV gets turned off also, then the TV just starts advertising itself. It starts putting up movies and stuff you can buy through the smart TV <laughs> part. And I'm like, I did not buy you yeah. so you could advertise to me in your downtime. That is not the This is This is the Kindlefication of everything. It's just like, <laughs> oh, you have a blank screen? Let me throw some ads up there. TV Nothing you can do to box. stop it. Try. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I paid full, there's no special offer there. That's right, I paid full price for that puppy, but pretty cheap my I mean, we all know the video uh, monitor companies tv companies are i think a few years ago it turned out that most of them weren't making any money i think samsung only the ones that made their own displays their own uh, panels were so they have to make money somehow they're skimming it off the top yeah um i'm writing down the kindlefication of everything i will use that somewhere <laughs> that's good i like Thank it. just you whenever our, in the hat <laughs> paris when you disconnect here there'll be an ad replacing you on the screen yeah uh, yeah, yeah it'll like just be minutes. you know like a little um, emoji but it'll just say like buy apple products <laughs> uh one of the things apparently uh and this is contrary to johnny ives long instructions uh Ger german says the iphone 14 pro models will have bigger 
Batteries. Woo-hoo. Okay, wait, why is that what Johnny Ive was against? He likes well, thinner, lighter. Bigger, yeah. But, uh, yeah, okay, I know, but a worse bigger, performing but... phone? Well, yes, and this is why I'm glad Sir Batteries Johnny... Batteries were inelegant. Has, that was the problem. Yes. Batteries <laughs> were the Being able to use your phone for more than eight hours a day is really inelegant. I agree. No, no, no. This is, this is going to end up being controversial. <laughs> I predict the new iPhone cutouts will be a lozenge and a pill, but... And this is the thing I think is going to be controversial. Apple is going to darken the screen between the lozenge oh. and the pill. Yeah, I saw this. To, and that's where it will do simulated lights for if your camera's on or your microphone's on. So that it will look like a big lozenge, except it won't be. The cutouts aren't. But the screen is going to just extend that. And then what How happens to this wedge of above? Of yeah. No. What happens to this border up here? Just thrown away? Just useless? You can't put anything so. up there? Up no, there is just going to be where it keeps there. saying like 5G plus plus plus. No, like no. The best service ever. <laughs> and go, meanwhile, all you have across. like That's one gonna bar. It's going to be here. Yeah. 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 We, we've changed the bar system. It's no longer five bars. It's 25 small bars. It's, it's a, 25 a small bar. bars and like seven it's star a, symbols. It's yeah. a bar crawl now. You're going to go to 25 <laughs> bars. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, five yeah. bars. Okay. And you're still not going to be able to make a video call if you're not connected to Wi-Fi. Okay. Let's see. What else? Oh, the air. AirPod 2. Now, AirPods are a product I am not, I have to be really covering. I'm rocking some AirPods. Are you? Are you? You like yeah. your AirPods? Oh, yeah. I love my you. AirPods just because I enjoy being in as close to silence as possible. They're I really the just number like one choice of uh, contributors on CNN, I believe. Mm. <laughs> I a very hot market. Yeah. I see them all the time. <laughs> and you can't miss it because it's a big white thing in your ear. And all of them have like the same buzz cut, right? Yeah. So it's kind of well, that too. Out. Yeah. Um, they will. The AirPod Two will have. You'll appreciate this. Uh, well, the Pros have noise cancellation. The AirPod Two is going to. I've got Pros. Yeah, yeah. these are going to yeah. sound better because uh, the rumor is, and I hope this is true, because Apple's been usually kind of laggard in Bluetooth. Uh, oh, the sound quality is awful. It's terrible. I'm using these just for audio in, but yeah. I have my oh, big yeah. mic well, for audio Yeah, don't audio listen to music. Don't, don't use them for a mic, absolutely. Yeah. The sound quality yeah. into your ear is pretty solid. I use them the for the a podcast, absolutely. and that's about it. This for is, listening this to is that yeah. thing... I, I get. I used to get so much email about uh, Bluetooth stuff at Macworld, and uh, a few years ago when I was doing an editing stint at Wirecutter, we wrote kind of a fact about people always like, why is Bluetooth... So audio bad? so bad. So <laughs> we were bad. like, well, and I actually contacted the Bluetooth SIG, and they were kind of like, well, it is bad because and I was like, wait, what are you, why are you great? It, there's wait a, a very, there's a very particular scenario <clears throat> that Bluetooth weirdly wasn't prepared for, which was streaming high quality audio in both directions right. in like certain circumstances. So right. like over, I think over Bluetooth LE. Uh, Bluetooth 4 LE, if you, the low power version, low energy, um, you can get, you can be using the wrong profile. So if you have the right device yeah. and the right profiles, it'll sound great. Then you will walk to a different device or even a different model of the same device, like an older MacBook, and you sound like you're coming in on an old uh, radio, you know, show from the 1950s or something. We. It's strange. Also, Bluetooth. I don't know if you guys have noticed this when walking around in large cities, but here in New York. Oh, Bluetooth man. has always really craps out when you're walking mm. across like an avenue or something. What? Even if your phone is in your pocket, really? it, I will say like oh. one out of five times will cut in and out. And I, I had a colleague who looked into this and wrote an article that I'm now forgetting the details of, of course, but I think it's because there are so many different signals that makes and sense. crossing yeah. off the same path that it Wait, ends up having you're crossing. Issues. You mean with like on a crosswalk and you're a bunch of people with you crossing yeah. or just... Yeah, yeah or I mean, even if you you're can... by yourself, like just because oh, there is weird. a lot happening in this space. Well, but Bluetooth uses, let's thank Hedy Lamar, actress Hedy Lamar, for uh, Bluetooth Spread frequency spectrum. hopping. Spread, Spread spectrum. spectrum. Yeah, sh it still uses frequency hopping, so it should actually be more resilient uh, for... but than anything else because it swaps among like 80 something frequencies on a pattern basis but that's uh i think in like high density locations it gets a bit confused <clears throat> Too much you reflection. Know? yeah Honestly, there's a lot of reflection going on i think there's a great gulf between the spec and the results uh, on all of this stuff and uh, apple will have a new the new h what is it the h chip the h3 i guess uh it will be in these new airpods and it is hoped by some that they will in fact upgrade the Bluetooth LE spec oh. to use LC3, which is a much higher oh. quality codec. Uh, Definitely a better. Google's I mean, I've got do the that. 
the Beats uh, Studio Buds, and they are absolutely rock solid for audio playback, and the audio input is terrible. I mean, it's yeah. I don't think it's the mic quality. I think it's simply the standard. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, that's I will the say the one thing about these AirPods mm. Pro, which I guess is like a recent software update that I absolutely love and wish would come to other devices that I have, like I have over the ear Bose headphones, is with Apple's Find My app. Yes. I lose everything always. So literally before we were recording this, I was like, where did I put my AirPods? And you can just open it up and it will tell you like, you're not close. And then you walk over to the other side of your house and you're like, you're closer. And then it's like, it's five <laughs> feet to your right and one <laughs> foot down and you can find them like that. And Never more than great. 10 feet from a pair of AirPods. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, every person ingests about 3.1. Yeah, if you've got AirPods them in your tummy, you're year, right next yeah. to them. I have air tags on my keys, but it does. The problem is you have to be near them or it says, I can't, I don't know where they are. And well, I no, you should enough, be able to. Uh, no, 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 it should, it no, no, it no, won't. It wait, won't, it other devices. Know. Oh, oh, you want the very short range. The I want to find finding. my keys. I'm. It's a but very why don't you just play the sound on them? Why don't you just you play? You can't the, unless play? they're unless they're. No, near. I've this tried. It says something. Sorry, something's terribly wrong. Then I lost my any... keys this morning, and it said hmm. we can't. You have to get closer to your keys for us to play a sound on them. Oh, that's right. It's Bluetooth mm. range for keys. That's right. It's, but it should be able to find them when you're. It has no idea. Oh. It says it's It'll in the house. It'll show you like near or far. They're in the house. They're in the house, but, you can't, it doesn't but I know they're in the house. Me. That's not the problem. It's where in the house. Liam, where you shouldn't have built they? your house as you shouldn't have built your house as a Faraday cage that blocks all signals. My yeah, house yeah, yeah. is a single story, so it's spread out. That's and so funny, I think though. honestly, so what I have to do, and what I did this morning, is wander all around the house until it says, "Oh, I see him now," and then it'll play a sound. I see, Leo. You know what you need to do with you and your. 87 phones the ones that are phones. iPhones you should hide <laughs> one in each room oh, that's and then idea. connect it oh, in the cloud so that your you're network. never yeah. oh you God. have one iPhone within every room to find your keys when you lose well, there's always an iPhone within 10 feet uh, I wrote a book about <laughs> air tags and find my of course because I've written a book about everything now and is uh, it a take control I, book or it's a take take control of air tags and find my or find okay my I might have to buy this and it's uh but it's funny I mean how do you write a book 120 page book about it it turns out to be easy because there's so much complexity but recently my I wife who is I we we call we say we use we call my wife the early rejector in the house and i use that with affection she doesn't want to adopt new technology uh before it's matured enough and you know i'm the person who's testing everything out and so the other day she said she got lost in a parking garage i've been lost in as well because there's multiple floors you can't get to from each other so she'd parked in one of them gone up an elevator and then taken the elevator down to a different part that's non-contiguous and she's like all right can i get an air tag for the car and she has a car she drives uh, more often than I do. But then when my older son and I drive that car, we're like, there's an air tag moving with you. He's like, what? Oh, it's Oh, Lynn's, I hate Lynn's, that. Lynn's tracking us. Uh, but, yeah. Mm. Yeah, you know what? This book, 130 pages, it should be longer. Pages. Should be longer. <laughs> Make it longer. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of privacy stuff. And All right. I need more. Honestly, the you one me thing something? I wish air tags could do, which I don't know why they haven't instituted this feature, is if you, let's say... Like I was uh, on a trip the other week and I had my air tag in my keys in the carry on that I left at the hotel while I was out and about like in a storage thing. And I was like, oh, I'd love it. Shouldn't I be able to turn on the setting that if my bag is moved, if my air tag is moved from this location, it gives me an alert. You can't do that for some reason. And you should be able to do that. Oh, that but it's an anti-stalking command. I it's know, an anti-stalking problem. Yeah. It's a two-edged... I know, it's funny. Somebody was just asked me the other day. They're like, I, exactly that. I left my luggage in my hotel room. Why can't I mark it? So when it moves, it's like, because the small percentage of people ruining it for all the rest of us are going to yeah. use that as a tool to track people. But but there should be a consent thing. There should be a way to say, um, I'm going to do this, but it's also going to, every time it does it, it's going to put out an alert immediately to everybody around you as opposed to a moving with you thing. I mean, there should be ways to make it more... Oh, uh, uh, it should be able to announce itself more that it's doing it while still keeping you, your device or your stuff uh, safe. Absolutely. Apple will not be announcing an AR or VR headset uh, on Wednesday. Mm. We're pretty sure of that. Although there was, right. there were rumors they would do a oh. VR headset this year. Uh, Mark Gurman is now saying next year. But they did file a trademark for uh, 
This is filed by Immersive <laughs> Health Solutions, LLC, in Wilmington, Delaware, which it turns out is an Apple shell corporation for a trademark for Reality One. So yeah. Reality... And 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 maybe they're going to call AR Apple reality, right? Um, reality yeah, One and Reality Apple Pro have been and trademarked. And Facebook, Meta, I guess, are just really going as broad as possible with these names. Yeah, well, it's hard. What are you going to call? I mean, Google Glass, Apple Reality. I don't know. I it's hard to. I mean, brand just how do you thing. trademark the word reality? That's my question. Like, well, how apparently are you, you do. And uh, over apparently you can. Apple yeah. Apple the world, we're just living in it. Uh, yeah. se in several countries over the past few weeks, including the U.S., they also trademarked uh, Apple, let's see, uh, Reality Processor. So that would be the uh, onboard. <laughs> it's called Our Brains, the Reality Processor. Uh, that will handle you know, the, Apple uh, Brain is yeah. yet to be trademarked. So what's yeah. your thoughts? I mean, are you waiting with bated breath for a uh, Apple VR AR headset? or I, I want to be convinced that I want it that's the thing for me i mean i i've i've used a little bit of vr stuff in the past apple's been talking a good ar game for a long time but i've always thought that the the demos they've done in their product demonstrations before are they don't really represent what's so great about it. like because they'll be up on the stage with the phone or the ipad and they'll be pointing it at a table and like hey, this is amazing <laughs> the reality has been all <laughs> but like fundamentally a phone and, an, and a tablet are not a good way to experience this because it's like peeping through a peephole, like look into the immersive world, but you have to hold this thing of glass in front of you in order to peek through. Whereas, you know, obviously a headset seems like a much better proposition for that. So they've laid a lot of groundwork for it, which is encouraging, but uh, it's a hard sell. I mean, I think Google learned this Honestly, yeah. a decade ago. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, Glasses are the ideal format, and I don't think we're ready for glasses because you want something that's inobtrusive, doesn't look like Google Glass. I, I know somebody on Twitter was pointing out, it was like, it was only a few years ago that people were literally beating people in the street for wearing Google Glasses. I'm like, yeah, it was kind of crazy. People got so mad about the feeling of invasiveness by them yeah. and the way that people who had early Google Glasses were using them without kind of... Exercise Have we changed enough as a judgment. society in the intervening time? I mean, everybody's got a camera on their phone or four different cameras but, on their phone. I mean, but are we used to that? We're going, I mean, no one's beating people up for wearing those Facebook Ray-Bans. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. The snap. Chat That's the same thing. Glasses, yeah. Or the yeah. Snapchat yeah. glasses. But I think yeah. once they're intrusive enough, if they're just a layer that you, is barely visible. Yeah, what if you and, were wearing them right now, Glenn, and on your your existing spectacles? If you were, <laughs> just if, just joining us it, with um, yeah. sunglasses on for yeah. the entire world. I, I actually don't Paris, speak English. You know? <laughs> I don't speak English. This is being translated live a and heads put up, up on my it glasses. Could be, it could be a heads up display on those glasses. It would be. Do you think? I guess they'd have to have oh a gosh. bigger battery. They'd have to have. But that's the goal. Clearly, I will say. I mean, the point, thing is, over the past, like. After, over the past month, I've had my just randomly thinking while I was doing stuff. I was like, man, it would be really nice to have a heads up display that somehow did work with either eye movements or maybe a voice component where mm. you're like washing the dishes and you're like, oh man, I wanted to like. I can't remember the name of that one thing I'm thinking of, and I don't want to have to dry my hands to look it up. The that switch would be great, is but between I think his legs, Paris. Between his. I know, I know, yeah. I always forget that. Um, but. <laughs> I'm the thing sorry, is, that's I mean, rude. I think there were a while. <laughs> no, listen. Sometimes you got to look it up. It's a callback. Um, yeah. The thing is, I think that we're a long ways away from making that work, like technologically. I don't feel speaking. like anybody wants this. That this is the tech industry saying oh. we need the next iPhone. What is it going to be? And that's, that's the best. That's how I feel about do. some of the VR stuff right now. Yeah. I think that AR could have very interesting real world applications that would be very useful but i think and that I, full vr right now is just too uncanny valley and it doesn't seem like there are that many use cases for it yeah and in the mm -hmm. ar side of things i think the you know you got to remember it's not like someone's going to come out and you know hand you that pair of spectacles that looks totally unobtrusive right that's not the first gen product no one's right, going to be right. And we perfected all it already, like Tron. Here, right? Yeah, it's gonna if if it is if there's something there, it's gonna take a whole bunch of iteration to get to that point. And I think that's the ultimate goal, but it's gonna be messy and ugly for a while 
from you know not everything is the original and smartphone. That, be, that might, might be enough on. to kill it right i mean look what it could be yeah. you looked so dorky on a segue that it was it it was over it was like yeah that's not going uh, yeah anyway. i mean here's the the thing that i think is a good example of how it would work though is you know an iphone as awkward as it is to hold an iphone up for augmented reality it can work incredibly well and for things like translation right that's the perfect use case right you hold it up and uh google translate and other apps will do that live translation thing on signage or subtitles or or whatever Menus. and that's, a, that's yeah that's great i mean we're not always Fantastic. traveling so or or offering live again live captioning if you had ai you know if you had siri live caption skype whatever system google but uh, nobody wants to, to hold up out. a phone all the time yeah. right and it's but it, right, but it, it works he personalizes you from like okay i'm staring glenn i'm talking to you but i'm looking at my that's phone well but it's a you. it's, I mean, a, it's, awkward, it's right? a worthwhile use case but the yes. form factor's wrong in right. most cases right right yeah. right agreed right uh, let's take a break. More to come. Our fabulous panel. Our show today brought to you by Zapier. I use Zapier all the time. In fact, it's how we produce the shows. Zapier is automation done right. If you're trying to grow a business, you know your time is precious. And what if you could streamline the boring stuff, the routine operations that eat up your time? Things like lead management, employee onboarding, customer support. That's what Zapier does. That's what's awesome about Zapier. It makes it easy to connect all the apps you use, to automate routine tasks, to streamline your processes so you got more time to do the stuff you're good at, customer and client needs, that kind of thing. It's the power of automation made possible for everyone. For instance, when I when I am going through my news feeds, my RSS feeds, I have a Zapier script. If I click a link uh, or a star of news feed, it automatically zaps it. It puts it up on my Twitch social feed. I have a news feed there. It puts it onto Pinboard, and, and it even adds it to a spreadsheet uh, called Leo's links that can easily be moved into a rundown spreadsheet. It all does that. I don't even have to think about it. I set this zap up years ago, and we've been using it ever since as a big part of our production, and it saves me so much time. I don't even have to... It's kind of... If I thought about it, I figure it's probably saving me hours every week, hundreds of hours every year. That's kind of mind-boggling, and it was so easy to set up. I use Zapier for all kinds of automation. Uh, and if you're in business... What a great way to get started with business automation. This is this is not low code. This is no code, zero coding. There are 4,000 apps that Zapier connects with. Uh, the most popular businesses, business apps out there, Google Sheets. I mentioned that. We use that. QuickBooks, Facebook, you have Google Ads, um, any RSS feed. You can automate almost any workflow imaginable with easy-to-use templates, thousands of them right on the site. You don't even have to write your own a lot of the times. And once you get good at it, the sky's the limit. The average user saves over $10,000 in recovered time every year. I guess that's that's accurate. If it's 100, if it's 200 hours a week a month for me, that's th a th that's 1,000 hours a year or more. Yeah. Yeah, I get paid more than 10 bucks an hour. No wonder over 1.8 million people and businesses use Zapier to streamline their work and find more time for what matters most. I've been a Zapier subscriber for, I think, as long as they've been around, for years and years. See for yourself why teams at Airtable and Dropbox and HubSpot and Zendesk, thousands of other companies, including Twit, use Zapier Every day to automate their businesses. Try Zapier free today. Z A P I E R. Zapier. <laughs> I love the name. They call the program Zaps. Zapier.com slash twit. Thank you, Zapier, for supporting the show and, I mean, literally um, streamlining my workflow. Let, let them streamline yours. Try it free. Zapier.com slash twit. Don't forget the slash twit. That's very important. So they know you sign here. Uh, I, <laughs> we were talking before the show about uh, Adam Newman, the guy who uh, started WeWork, uh, and then um, you know kind of drove it to the ground, but walked away with a lot of money. He got bought out by uh, uh, SoftBank. Now he's the, buying. The uh, definition of failing up. Failing <laughs> up is right. He's uh, yeah. now buying. Now getting more money. <laughs> apartments and yeah, Anders Andreessen Horowitz uh, just gave him three hundred fifty million dollars but that's not the news story the news story is 
my friend Kevin Rose getting $50 million for his Moonbirds. NFTs, a $50 million funding round for the Proof Collective. Now, I have to point out, Kevin actually already made $50 million selling these Moonbirds as NFTs. They made so much money that he had to make a YouTube video saying, we're going to do something really good with this, <laughs> with this money. <laughs> That's always uh, a sign. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I guess, you know, the rich get richer. Um, and, you know, I love Kevin, so I'm glad he's, he's, he's getting the money. Um, the uh, Proof Collective will get $50 million not only from uh, A16Z, uh, but also from Alexis Ohanian's v VC firm, 776. What's with the numbers on these things? Oh. I, I don't know. $10 million funding round uh, in April. Uh, and uh, great, <laughs> I guess. Here's my pitch. <laughs> I think, you know, everybody, instead of investing all this money in NFTs, should give me their $50 million. Yes, and I, sure. in return, what will we get? Will, uh, will we get a sequin mannequin? Everybody, butt? I will, okay, let's say, you know, instead of your NFTs, you can get a very bespoke collectible once in a lifetime opportunity to own a piece of a mannequin butt that there's only Perfect. one of in the world Perfect. and it's encoded in this blockchain called reality which <laughs> albeit has been copyrighted by apple so we oh, might have to work around that good point but there's only one of them so you know it's going to be a real collector's object i just I would like to buy one dollars. art <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> one art. Go ahead, Glenn. What do you want to buy? I would like to buy one art, please. Please give me That's art. A future, future, I'll take Futurama reference I, for those. Who yes. Can. Yes. How about you? What do you think, Dan? I think fifty million dollars buys a lot of copies of my book, so ah. we'll just want to oh, do that. That's a good best. Very I think best we could. Seller. How about the four of us split fifty mil? We call it even. Yeah. There we go. I, I think, think that's good. I, I think you know. I agree. I, yeah. yeah. I Proof. can't NFTs. Are the biggest hammer that's ever been developed in technology with no nails. There are no nails. <laughs> I think almost blockchain is that. I know everybody says, "Oh, the technology is really interesting," but it's just it's just a distributed database. That's that's really but, what it is. It's not. Blockchain. Leo, so many people are screaming at their phones. Yeah. They're throwing them across the wall. You got to stop this. I, I, I can see a purpose for block. I can see a purpose for. A, a blockchain, and I think we will have them. I think we will have a. Uh, I think we will have a purely digital tech. Uh, or sorry, I think we'll have a version of uh, fiat currency, of government-backed currency. Um, you know, China's already working on the digital renminbi, and we're going to have a version of it in America, and there'll be a version of the EU and so uh, the uh, euro and so forth that uses blockchain blockchain technology. And it may be an incredibly bad idea, but I think it will happen. And I think it will be. Why does blockchain make it better? What makes that better? There is a utility in having an irre uh, uh, of an auditable, irreversible, permanent, cryptographically uh, verifiable record of things. But the number of cases in which that's useful compared to a database are very small. <laughs> And there's a high price. Yeah. I mean, let's face it. Right. There's a significant right. price in terms right. of transaction costs, transaction Privacy. time, oh, yeah. and, and energy usage yeah. to doing it this way. So you better but, damn well have a good reason for it other than blockchain. Know, Leo, but those monkeys are real cool looking. I think that's a great Proof idea. is also creating a <laughs> Moonbirds DAO which will oversee licensing of the Moonbird's name by granting trademark rights and deploying capital to projects that, quote, further the Moonbird's mission. I'm glad they have a mission. The Dow will control a soon-to-be-formed Dow Treasury. Quick question. Are we sending these birds to the moon? Do the birds come from the moon? <laughs> Are they already there? The relationship no moon with the involved. Birds the moon? I'm not clear on not, this. I don't know what their mission is. Or is the moon is. like an aspirational goal? Like the birds to the moon <laughs> spiritually? <laughs> they're, they're, you know? I, I love that. Uh, they're Tom owls. Hanks, the they're, birds to the moon. They're owls. <laughs> That's all. They're owls. just owls. Monkeys. Wait, 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 they're, they're, owls? Owls? they're owls. Monkeys were taken. So uh, they're owls. Aww. The only Dow I invest in is Georgia Dow. That's yeah, it. I like Georgia Dow. Dow stands for a decentralized... The only Dow I invest in is Ann Dowd. You know, great character <laughs> actress. The Dow stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization... Or 
No, what is it? Now I've forgotten. Wait a minute. Decentralized Autonomous County. Organization. Yeah. It's, uh, it's also kind of a cool idea. It's a, a lot of these things are cool ideas, and then the people who are implementing them make me want to run away into the hills. They're cool ideas for taking your money out of your wallet and putting right. it in mine. Proof well, is also at least for a little bit until it gets you know hacked and then put in something. That's else. true. But yeah, that's I a feel good like point. It's all implementation okay. though. I mean, we've oh, okay. Oh, I was going to say something completely irrelevant. Please continue. Oh, well, <laughs> this baby, but we we've all talked about Web three is going great. You know, one, my wonderful favorite site, site of wonderful the last site. few months. Yeah, and it's Fantastic. just this. It's you know, it's the kazoo playing at the ongoing funeral that people refuse to accept is a funeral for cryptocurrency and DAOs and, and NFTs. But uh, I I think I think the there's a fundamental problem is not that the technology is bad, is that everyone involved in it immediately went into the sort of grifting and churn and hype mode. So it's there's no um, the entire you can't take anything that's going on right now, I think, and build something meaningful because there is so much bad that's happening. Here's an example. Bill Murray auctioned off an NFT oh my God. representing that. the right to drink a beer with him, during which a painter will paint a picture of the scene that the buyer can keep. The auction at benefits a, a charity, Chive Charities, a veterans and first responder focused nonprofit. The NFT sold for 119.2 ETH. That's $185,000, give or take. Hours after the auction, a hacker gained access to Murray's crypto wallet and snagged the ETH for themselves. Oh, my God. They also attempted to steal 800 oh NFTs from the remaining collection by Bill Murray, although a wallet security team was able to safeguard those NFTs in time. What I love about Shoot. this is like everybody compares these things to gold rushes, but what I love about it is this is the grift rush, right? And it's just like everybody <laughs> constantly stealing from each other. It's kind of hilarious from the outside anyway. From the outside, and that's the key. Stay on the outside, baby. Stay what, on the what's outside. The, Speaking of which, the what's, one person who's doing quite well is I don't know if you guys saw the story that crypto.com accidentally sent a woman ten million dollars. Uh, yeah. Or I guess uh, not yes. in fiat, yeah. Yeah. but instead and of one hundred and, and they didn't, didn't notice it. for months. <laughs> and she bought a mansion because it just, you know, if I was to oh, accidentally yeah. get $10 million and not have anybody follow up for months, yeah. I would, uh, you know, I'd bank, be into Bank that. error in your favor, as the old card says. They sent, uh, a woman asked for $100 uh, Australian refund. They sent her $10.5 million instead because... <laughs> Instead of entering the amount of the refund, somebody oh working God. at Crypto.com accidentally entered an account number into the <laughs> refund amount section, you know, which, you know, it turned out that account number was effectively 10.5 million Australian dollars. Now, I have to say, she's kind of uh, a little bit at fault here. She didn't say, hey... You gave me ten million. I only wanted a hundred. She put the money into a joint account with her sister. Bought her sister a five-bedroom house. That's sweet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, very no, generous. I, no notes. Well, now I've it's no in litigation, and Crypto.com oh, yeah. has to yeah. prove that she did something wrong, which well, is she's, kind yeah. of difficult to do. Uh, yeah. Yeah, actually, it's an interesting point. I mean, there, this happened recently, though, in the in the mainstream financial market. Uh, was last. Year. I was about to say with Citigroup. You, the and Revlon Devlon. thing, yeah. Somebody didn't check some compliance box and they sent, what was it, $400 million? Oh, so went Citigroup accidentally paid uh, yes. $900 million in debt million. Uh, to Revlon uh, creditors, like their lenders. It yes, was supposed to yes. be just like, oh, a small thing. They accidentally paid the whole debt and they were like, oopsie, can we have that money back? And they're like, no. Uh, no, <laughs> you <laughs> owed it to us. Uh, yeah. They got like 400 or 500 million back and the remaining uh, companies that didn't want to return it went to court and the judge said, well, um, based on the doctrine of finders, keepsers and no backsies. Uh, no, <laughs> really? I don't know. Really? Yeah, That's yeah, a legal absolutely. doctrine. Huh? Okay. It was a legal doctrine that effect, it was the, I mean, the judge analyzed the terms of the transfer. It didn't matter that it was an error because the creditors had every reason to believe it was a legitimate right. uh, they were owed transaction. The money. Yeah. They were owed the money. It was spent to them. So some, I think, have the creditors did not agree to uh, return it. And it's a very funny, long running. It's always uh, hilarious when you see just how fragile the underpinnings of our society <laughs> yes. actually is, right? Just one wrong checkbox and the whole thing comes like, crashing. This down. was two random dudes, I believe, like overseas, whose job was to put some numbers in a box. And like one yep. of them put the wrong numbers and the other one didn't catch it. That's it. If you, if you missed gone. out on the original Moonbirds, uh, there's a <laughs> early 2023 Moonbird Mythics. <laughs> oh, thank God. A profile picture collection 
of 20,000 oh, NFTs yeah. with, quote, an eye toward giving back to the original Moonbirds and Oddities collectors. Oh I still don't know what any of those words what mean. Is, you know? Yeah. Okay, what is the hearth of an odd god? Okay, I'm just going to read this sentence, scroll up a little oh, bit please. for a second, because okay. there was a really good one Okay, there. here? Uh, the hearth of the odd god. When an egg enters the hearth, it will hatch 24 hours later. What does that mean? You That's can the hatch. answer to the you question, can, you can how hatch. do you get a mythic with an oddity? <laughs> you can hatch it. <laughs> you can hatch it. Only 25 oddities will be burned each day. Oh, uh, Sure. What? Sure. If what? someone started saying hey, those words to me, I'd assume I was having a stroke. So, you know what you breaks my heart? It was like the artist, who, the artist who paints paints these. Yeah. Same thing with the Yuga Labs uh, board apes. Yeah, they get paid like a flat fee. Like, yeah, they don't get any of this money of this. from the actual trades. Yeah, but this they also don't have I no exposure, like, like, so it feels like you walk uh, away with at least uh, at least you got paid they, in probably real money. Uh, yeah, Maybe? a couple hundred bucks. Yeah, Maybe. Maybe. Well, this is how I feel like my grandparents felt when I tried to explain the internet to them. You know, they're just like, <laughs> there's no context for it. It doesn't make any sense. There's no. It's all abstract. But it's like, I mean, the the part is of the internet turned out to be useful I, no that that might be a mistake maybe i was wrong on that part where nfts are definitely not but maybe we're, maybe the jury's still out i'm the sure if i got kevin on he would have a uh explanation for why this is good and valuable and true and sure and and all that it's unlicensed securities trading you that's, know it's that's i'm afraid what the sec is going to decide but without yeah any of so the rules or regulations you're me is and i guess if you're really into that and making money it's good for making good money for you good for but i don't think that it's an, a net good to the world <laughs> it's the multi-billion dollar version of the two kids i saw today on the bike path near my house <laughs> selling pokemon cards oh nice at their table i think that's oh, like right. basically future that's uh, like Future, yeah. future uh, NFT crypto NFT traders. Crypto traders. Yeah, you just gotta walk up to those kids and be like, "So, have you heard about the blockchain?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this would be much get, get out now. Yeah. Get out now. It's too. <laughs> They'll no. call their parents yeah. immediately. Yeah. Uh, I, somebody in the chat room saying, "We'll bring Kevin on." No, nope. <laughs> not gonna do it. Uh, we're. I've already told uh, staff and producers, and I'm sorry if you're all into this stuff. Nobody who's gonna come on. Uh, any of our shows who's going to flog NFTs, flog currents, cryptocurrency, uh, I've, I'm washing my hands of it because, you know what, I don't want to be responsible if you go out and right. bet your rent money on an NFT thinking you're going to make all this money and it just lines the pocket of somebody who's already got it. But Leo, what about an algorithmic stable coin? It's got the word stable in it. Doesn't it's stable. That it's got to be good unless it collapses. I mean, there's nothing and... that's ever gone wrong with those yeah. before, right? Oh, Lord. I like Kevin a lot. Uh, I can't say I... Uh, endorse what he's doing with this and he and you know what they're going to say well that's just because you're old and you don't understand it you're a you're you know you're like larry david you're a, a boomer you can't even find your keys okay boomer. yeah i can't even <laughs> find my keys so I'm what do the i know bloop. i'm hitting the bloop bloop and the button doesn't go it doesn't play a sound what's going on with that but his garage door has opened and closed about six seven times so that's working great my i'm logged out of facebook suddenly <laughs> Uh, the, uh, I'm laughing because it hurts because actually uh, uh, oh, I am that old but I do a radio show where people who are actually much older than me call in and exactly those questions and I have to go hey. <laughs> oh I have a great account to follow a uh, Jessamine West who uh, is at Jessamine that's M-Y-N who's a librarian in uh, and a futurist and a great technology thinker but she's a librarian in Vermont and uh, one of the greatest people to who I think writes and thinks about the future of what information online is but also is just like a librarian and she has this regular thing where she ha seniors come in and people of any age but often seniors come in and she helps them with technology and she tweets it out and with absolute love right and it's fascinating to see i love this insight this is why i love writing the uh, mac 911 column at macworld also is i same love thing. the insight yeah, you're doing the same thing you're yeah you're i want to know work. what yeah what is hurting people what is the friction what doesn't make sense to them and if i can solve that i feel great but i also i want to understand how people conceptualize technology and so she's seeing you know people who have not encountered or or are using it are functionally almost illiterate in technology but they have to use it every day and they come to her a librarian for help anyway, i she's love great. it used to live in seattle she calls That's her fantastic. she calls herself the rural tech geek yeah 
which is easier than saying the rural juror. Jessamine, <laughs> J-E-S-S-A. I technically own Metafilter, that's right. She also, was a, for many years, was one of the main people below Matt Howie. Uh, oh, I love Matt, and I love Metafilter. Yeah, Matt's, All right, well, Matt's great. Yeah, yeah, she was a moderator, or whatever they call I don't think they call them moderators. Whatever the name was there, that was... I still big, uh, subscribe uh, to Metafilter. It's still active. It's a very lovely site. Yes. They did a great job building a community. Boy, we have now mentioned Waxy Links and Metafilter. <laughs> we, <laughs> what we, year is it? Much, we, <laughs> we are old. I've been writing about this in my live journal, so everything's... Uh, suck.com? I don't know what's this. Uh, oh, I miss Suck.com. I love suck. the design of Dig. It's never going to change, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. right. That's right. Uh, speaking of Kevin Rose, yeah. We kind of got yeah. Dig oh, in there as well. that's right. Yeah, it all comes good. around. That's funny. And then meanwhile, the, these youngsters, these super snappers, have announced USB 4 version 2.0. Oh, I got things to say about that. I knew, I Guys, knew I Glenn would have things. I just want one USB to rule them all. Uh, so, there are too many types. I, we just got to pick I, one. I got a back channel to somebody who's involved in these discussions who is very unhappy because of people making fun of this name, but simultaneously also told me that this is an internal product spec version release number. And at some level, the people, the USB implementers forum, the USB IF that manages the spec, they have these two parts. One is kind of a public facing part and one is a developer uh, and like manufacturer facing part. This press release came from the developer manufacturing part. It's uh, like, hey, it's awesome. We've got version 2.0 of 4.0 of 6.3 <laughs> of 7 out. Everyone's like, yay, right? Uh -huh. And the consumers are like, oh God, they're giving us new numbers. Is the U is it going to be a trapezoidal connection again or a dodecahedron? Like, what am I? <laughs> Gonna, what am I going to do? I need to get so, new cords. So he's like, he's like, look, when this actually ships, it's going to be called USB 4. And what it's going to say is 80 gigabits per second. And it'll be labeled and you'll know if your devices are. And it'll all be. It's oh, be that's such a lie. You it's are going to be straight. No, that's such a lie. That's not true. That's so untrue. They always say this. Oh, don't worry. You get that Type C cable. There'll be a, a, a sigil oh on God. it that will tell you what it can do, and then on the port of your computer there will be a little sigil that will say what it can do, and then you match the two. To Nobody puts any of those symbols on anything. You don't They're know what it does. The, or, the product listing word. when you buy it will say every word that has ever been <laughs> made that's associated <laughs> with technology. It'll be like cord monitor power speed 80 bits 200 Extra fast. High. Extra high ultra speed. They gotta fast. do what version oh 4.2. If you mismatch your yeah. sigils, then you summon a demon. They, so you get exactly. Really yeah, yeah, yeah. The use sigil there is a good. That's a good uh, sixty-four dollar word there. I think that's uh, what they yeah. are. They seem to be well, burning with fire. Uh, As I said, I've written a book on every topic, and I have a book called Take Control of Untangling Connections, and oh, it is in wow. part about <laughs> understanding... It's sorry. either about cords or about your when love life. <laughs> <laughs> or both. It's, well, you, or there's a narrative that runs through it. It's very complicated. <laughs> uh, she was USB. He was Thunderbolt. Oh, never not, they'd they'd never, never. Then, <laughs> you then you got a sigil emblazoned on his forehead and some of the No load. child of mine will ever marry a trapezoidal <laughs> type B connector. <laughs> Uh, but, this is the book yeah. you have to read if you want to get all the answers on how to connect USB, Thunderbolt, Ethernet, DisplayPort, HDMI, and audio. Oh, uh, it's, Lord. It was a, an incredible journey writing this book. But but I think the, ni the nice part, and still the announcement of USB 4 version 2.0, was that it seemed like we have, if you have um, relatively recent devices and they have a USB-C port on it, generally you plug in a Thunderbolt 4 slash USB 4 cable. That's kind of the oh. new universal cable. <laughs> and everything you works. You lost me. <laughs> Uh, all right, let me go back there. There's a slash in there, and the slash on Paris's keyboard doesn't work. <laughs> you know, I was about to say, people Paris keep telling me about Thunderbolt, and I'm like, this is too much. <laughs> Listen, I just want Thunderbolt. one. <laughs> Thunder slash. Glenn, it's you're digging Vondava a deeper hole. Cable. I don't think it's getting better. Oh, no, um, no. Whatever it is, we'll have 80 gigabits per second of bandwidth, which is, you know, about 100 gigabits more than you'll ever need. But okay, good, <laughs> frankly. Fine. Uh, Whatever no, it is, it's going in the shoebox in the bottom of my drawer it, with all the other cables. You can use I your old cables, but yeah. they won't be as fast. I did discover the reason you want 40 gigabit per second, and this is, it took, because most things don't need it. You don't have a RAID drive. A hard whatever. drive can't do it, yeah. It, Let alone right. 80. Modern, yeah. SSDs, the most, the fastest modern SSDs can actually perform at rates where you're starting to hit above a limit of 20 gigabits per second, which was kind of the earlier high point for USB and Thunderbolt uh, uh, 2 and some forms of Thunderbolt 3. So all the current specs are like, okay, we do 40. If you're all up to date, everything does 40. And then the fastest SSD you can buy 
can perform at its uh, highest internal bus rate. And that's kind of the, that's the bottom line. So they're doing 80 because there's a new generation of SSDs uh, that will be out at some point, and you'll want to be able to use those also, at full speed for video and whatever. People will use docks. I mean, I think this is the real yeah. reason. With multiple oh, connections, yeah, yeah. sharing that 80, gig 80 gigabits, that 80 exactly. gigabit port. I've got a stupidly expensive dock sitting under my monitor, and it pained me to buy it, but... Man, it's lovely. Yeah, got all my seven hundred ports on it, or uh, I, I reviewed one. I mean, like because it's ports. like a Mac one, it's not as many as it's I'd obsolete. Like, because by I can't the way. have anything. Does it do Thunderbolt yeah. four three point two? It does do all the Thunderbolts. <laughs> I don't know. I hate it. <laughs> I was like, Cal I just digit want one that dog. has like six I have USBs. The, I have but the also Cal Digit. Two I bet she has the Cal Digit and the, the Cal Thunderbolts digit, and an, Cal digit is and amazing. an Ethernet. Yeah, Important. it's like CalDigit one is like three hundred dollars, yeah. but it has I think literally eighteen ports coming out of it. Yeah, so you plug in the CalDigit. It's a great unit. It's a kind of expensive, but it's like it has every kind of USB, Thunderbolt, Display Port, HDMI, multiple. It's like if you just want to buy a thing and it answers the need, I'm you throw that to, thing. This is well, not that's it. a tiny one. This they have one. It. It's like the uh, you. It was you couldn't get it for a long time. I waited. Yeah, it was out of forever uh, to the get. The thing it. is, I took a long time looking in this and I was like, I want coding. one that has at least a cord that like plugs it into my computer that is at yes. least more than three inches this is because it. I yes. put my computer up on a monitor. Yeah, yeah. that is, I do have that TS3 one. TS3 yeah. plus. 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 Plus plus. Two pluses. Plus plus. It's, it's so good. It looks yeah. like it could be like it, a look small at these explosive port. device. <laughs> it kind of <laughs> seems obscene. There's like, if you have that, uh, what's the thing if you have um, the fear of uh, holes? Uh, oh, not trick Yeah, yeah. I think it's like musophilia or There's a fear of holes? Yeah, people yeah. have yeah. the people cameras. Are, and like on the holes cameras are on scaring the people left and right. Yeah. Yeah. You can't yeah. live in Switzerland if you have this fear. It's very, very hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I so, like that. I like that. Pull those ports because it looks like the uh, the old uh, onion article about we're going to put five blades on the right there. <laughs> like put another port on it. it. Is, we're it doing is all outrageous, the ports. But it's Where's really my like, port? It's a really good unit. It's really good. It's got. It draws like a hundred and forty watts. It's oh, this is kind man. of this is the ultimate thing. This is the like the killer dock. If you really if I just need that many ports, I've it. taken a wrong turn somewhere. I've done something wrong in <laughs> I life. I need that many ports, and I've taken a lot of wrong here's, turns. Here's the thing. I mean, I waited. I finally got it a couple of months ago. I waited six months to get it because they, they couldn't yeah. keep couldn't get the parts or whatever. And now, thanks to USB, what is it? <laughs> USB 4 yeah, version 2.0. 2. It's obsolete. Got to buy a new one. <laughs> Just throw it in the garbage. Throw it in the recycling, the electronics recycling bin. Thanks a bunch, USB. <laughs> they should do what the Wi-Fi Alliance does. They should just have names instead of all these. Just call it USB for greased lightning. They should name oh. it like the name Hurricanes. Yeah. It should be like, Sally. this is the season of female names. Yeah. This is the season of male yeah. names. You could oh. be like, screw you, Mike. I want <laughs> Nina. <laughs> This is, you mean the Wi-Fi Alliance, the one that introduced the numbering system and then decided to introduce Wi-Fi 6E? Yeah. That Wi-Fi Alliance? That Wi-Fi Alliance. That the, Wi -Fi this Alliance. feels like it's the same people who are naming cell phone uh, like signals. It's actually, yeah, it's one group. It's actually one group of people <laughs> just naming everything. The name is I'm driving with my fifth. They just have a big bag full of numbers and letters. Yeah, and they just, just pull it out. I'm like, what is this? I'm <laughs> driving with my 15-year-old yesterday, and they're like, I'm not getting good 5G service. What a incredible complaint. And I said, oh, does it say 5G, or does it say 5UG, or does it say 5UW? And they're like, yeah. what are you talking no, about? Yeah, that's right. Well, like let me explain. AT&T AT had 5GE, which then, wasn't they, 5G. It was LTE <laughs> posing as 5G. You, Glenn, did your kid open the door to the car and just roll slowly out as you just... <laughs> 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 yeah. Is it UC? Well, Is like, it UW? Uh, yeah. My favorite thing is like now that all the networks have upgraded, like if your cell phone service even goes to like 4G LTE, it's like you're living in the Stone Age. It's like oh, I yeah. cannot Terrible. download a tweet. Terrible. It's already it's like somehow we lived like this. Yeah. How did we survive? Uh, actually, interestingly, I think this is a uh, this, we'll do one more story, then we'll take a break. But I think this is really I'm making I'm happy. Comcast and Charter says Fast Company, face a grim new reality, actual oh. competition. And where's it coming from? T-Mobile and Verizon's residential internet service using their 5G oh, man. network. Verizon, Fi Verizon Fios, that's what I've got right now. Yeah. But I not, have not even Fios internet speech. Yeah, yeah, but that's, you got something, you got a landline good thing. I got this for my daughter. She, I'm already a Verizon customer, so it's 25 bucks a month. It's just a little... Verizon 5G receiver that turns it into Wi-Fi. 
And oh, uh, nice. it's for residential service. 138 gigs, uh, megabits down. Uh, it's like 20 or 30 megabits up. It's very good service for 25 bucks a month. And yeah. this has stalled Comcast and Charter. Zero growth last quarter. I internet. love that this is the thing because it's the inverse of like 10 years ago, AT&T had those micro cells, yes. right? You yeah. into Wi-Fi and give you yeah. phone signal. And now it's like, ha-ha, she was on the <laughs> other foot. <side. laughs> <laughs> yeah, my uh, my dad and stepmom live in a relatively small town in Washington that has okay cable service, and my dad calls me up. He's reasonably technically savvy in his eighties. He's for his eighties. He's very technically savvy, and he said, "I think the service is going in and out." And we we're talking about stuff, and he's like, "It just keeps going down and up." And I'm like, "Have you called the cable company? Ugh. They get like a hundred megabits Ugh. per second. It's like, yeah, I don't know. I'm like, I, and he said, then he emails me. He said, "I've heard about this new T-Mobile service. Should I get it?" I'm like, you know, I've heard good things about it. He orders it. It's fifty dollars including tax a month plugs it in and like i say they're in a relatively small you know not super remote it's like two hours from seattle with a ferry ride and he's getting 100 megabits per second exactly. it's been up like 99.9 yep. percent of the time they cancel their 80 something dollar a month cable service because they don't like it and now they got a thing that works so. t-mobile now has more than a million subscribers wow okay. half of whom they added in the last quarter this is by brian roberts at comcast said this is killing All us right. verizon sure. has 384,000 <laughs> home internet subscribers, two thirds of which from the last quarter. It's it's gone from zero to sixty very very quickly. Now I should caution: it will not work everywhere. You have to be close yeah, to a five yeah. G tower that it can't be congestion. Um, if you're lucky enough to have that service nearby, as my daughter is, it works great. It's flawless. I checked. I, and the other thing is because I'm the Verizon customer, I can check her bandwidth at any time. So huh. I've been checking it day and night just to see, and it's fine. It never goes, <laughs> it never goes down. What are you doing? Just a what are you online thing, Day and link? night, you're like, are day you and night, I'm video? checking. <laughs> check it. And uh, Blu ray player usage is really down. <laughs> Where's your iPod? She's got three iPods. <laughs> no, we, we have one gigabit uh, internet service to our house, and it's because our local telephone company was failing. And so they, they rolled out, did a big bet the company thing and they rolled out fiber Good for all over the place. Good so that's them. the flip side is I pay 80 something dollars a month for gigabit internet and Comcast has, still has terrible more expensive service in my neighborhood and so I think they're being killed on that lower end and the higher end. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. Competition is a good thing here. This is yeah, because all the, the cable monopoly. 20 bucks a month for 400 up down and it's fantastic. What? How wow. is that? Sweet. Somehow with Verizon, I... I wow. moved over my phone bill. It like Weird. bundled with my home. The home is only twenty dollars. Every apartment That's I moved great. to in New York, I make a Verizon man come up, scale the wall, and drill a hole into my wall <laughs> to put the fiber thing in. And then I run extension Can cords throughout my entire say, home. Don't or not show him Ethernet. Don't you know? show him the lamp though, because he may, he may never I come won't, back. I won't. You know. Yeah. Last time I think he might have seen um, one because they accidentally left a fancy router just like sitting oh. on my fire escape. So nice. I took it. as they now ran. I have to. It's yeah. great. They you ran. Know, listen. All right, let's take a break. And I have the can. final stories. This is going on way too long, but I'm having way too much fun. <laughs> Paris, Martin Oakland, Fleischman. Uh, so great to have you, Dan Morin. Uh, we got to do this again soon. You guys are fantastic. Our show today brought to you by Stamps.com. Somebody called the radio show today, said, I want to sell online. How should I do the mailing? What kind of printer do I need? Whatever. I said, no, 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 no. It's very simple. You check with... The vendor, see what they tell you to use. If it's stamps.com, you're golden. You don't need a special printer. You don't need anything. Stamps.com is the biggest boon for the small business owner. We're getting ready for the holiday season. It's coming up. Uh, if you, I hope you still don't, and I, God, I remember this a couple of years ago, going to the post office, standing behind somebody who had an armful of packages she was mailing she was waiting in line to mail them. That's crazy. Stamps.com can do it all without a trip to the post office. You never have to leave your desk. It's a 24-7 post office you can access anywhere. No lines, no traffic, no hassle. Uh, we've been using them since, uh, I don't know when. I they, We've been doing their ads since 2012. I think we've been using them for longer than that. Haven't you tried them yet? Uh, you've heard me talk about it. What are you waiting for? And by the way, it's getting better. Stamps.com now is your one-stop shop for all your shipping and mailing needs. For more than 20 years, it's been indispensable for more than a million businesses because they can print real U.S. postage right on the envelope or on a package. But now it's USPS, the United States Postal Service, and UPS 
together. Which means you can sh you can price shop right there from your desk, get the best deal, get the be get the shipping you need. And nowadays, with inflation on the rise, every dollar counts. Every business needs this. Protect your margins; you'll get major discounts on both postal service and UPS rates, up to eighty six percent off deals you can't get at the post office. In fact, Stamps.com negotiated a great deal with UPS. There's no residential surcharge. That saves you a huge amount for every package you ship to a home. It's a stress-free solution for every small business. You can print postage wherever you do business. All you need is a computer and a printer. You don't have to get up. You don't have to go to the post office. In fact, if you're using the post office, a uniformed employee of the federal government will come and pick up that mail and take it to the post office, your mail carrier. If you need a package pickup, you could schedule it right through the dashboard. Uh, same with UPS. Rates are constantly changing, but with Stamps.com's switch and save feature, you can easily compare carriers and rates so you know you're getting the best deal. You're saving money, and it's fantastic for an online store. It works seamlessly with all the major shopping carts and marketplaces. They'll actually fill in all the forms automatically. You don't have to do any typing. Print right on the envelope if you're sending an envelope. Print a package label. They'll even suggest, hey, this might be a better media mail. Save some money this way. Look, get ahead of the holiday chaos this year. Get started with stamps.com. We love it. I I I couldn't I can't recommend it more highly. Sign up with the promo code TWIT right now. You'll get a very generous special offer. Four week trial, free postage, free digital scale, no long term commitments, no contracts. It's easy. Here's how you do it. Go to stamps.com. Up in the right-hand corner of the webpage, there's a microphone. It says something like, do you hear this on a podcast or on the radio? That's the one. Click that. See there, up there on the right, and enter the code TWIT. That's it. Then you get the deal. It's the best deal. Don't do the front page deal. To use this offer code. Trust me, it's it's worth $110. bucks. Stamps.com. We love you. Thank you, Stamps.com, for your long support of our uh, network. And you support us, by the way, when you use that offer code TWIT. That's how you let them know that you saw it here. Stamps.com. Calm. All right. We got a few uh, quick stories to. Oh, before we do that, I want to wrap it up. But before we do that, I got it. We made this great promo. Thank you, Benita, for reminding me. This is what happened this week on Twit. Hey there, hi there, hi there. Are we you can, trying if, to connect if, the uh, sideburns now? Or are they are they going to actually? Or is there? Or is that their idea? I am fully aware. Okay, thank you very much. Here, yeah. At least get my profile. I thought that yeah. maybe they'd come to life and they were uh, deciding that they should uh, join, join up in the middle. No, no, they're they're a team player. My brand is not always on my <laughs> side, but the, the my sideburns they're always pulling with the team. Previously on Twit. Tech News Weekly. Jason Allen ended up with a first place win in the Colorado State Competition. And as you can probably guess, Jason did not paint this picture. The picture were generated by an artificial intelligence engine called Midjourney. This week in Google. Let's start with AB 2273, which passed 33 to nothing. Age-appropriate design code. What California is doing is really sort of trying to completely change the way the internet works and you know I, I think effectively they're sort of trying to turn it into Disneyland where uh, everything has to be appropriate for children at all times. Windows Weekly. And I got on Twitter yesterday and God <laughs> damn it Jensen Harris has come out of a hole in some woods somewhere. He is criticizing the Windows 11 start menu. Oh! There is such a lack of self-awareness here this is like a drunk driver pointing to someone not using their blinkers and saying, that guy's being bad. Twit. You destroyed Windows. You destroyed it. Uh, I have some very good news. Paul Thorat will not be joining the Apple uh, live event stream on Wednesday. <laughs> it scared the hell out of so many people. <laughs> you, you understand why that would be humorous. I don't know if you've ever followed Paul funny. during an Apple yeah. event and his tweets. He is not the biggest fan. Uh, but I thought, well, that would be a good antidote to the Apple event. But no, it will be me and Andy Anako this Wednesday. <laughs> would have been fun, though. I wish, we'd, I wish we could have gotten Paul to do it. He said, I don't need the, uh, I don't need the opprobrium. Uh, but uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, yep, 1 p.m. Eastern time, 1700 UTC, Wednesday the 7th for the big Apple infomercial. And uh, Andy and I will, uh, will give you context. 
Story of the week. And actually, the headline scared the hell out of me when I saw the picture. Doctor uses his <laughs> Rivian R1T to perform vasectomy during power outage. It was a one in a million chance, Doc. A one in a million chance. <laughs> uh, I, I probably like you, might have misunderstood this story, especially because it looks like that Rivian is crashing into the doctor's office. But no. In fact, a doctor based in Austin, Texas, Dr. Christopher Yang... Uh, was set to perform a vasectomy in his clinic when the power went out, as it as it is wont to do in Austin, Texas. His patient said, Doc, <laughs> I can't reschedule. Can we just go ahead and do this? The doc... <laughs> Now, you could probably... I just want to be inside the, the mind of a patient who's like, listen, I know the power's out, but I got to get go, this man. cut. Gotta I got to really get important. this done. I can't I don't know. wait. What is, the, what is the rationale? What is driving this person? Why do they need really this? I really battery power. Yeah. I need the backstory. It's, it's got 314 miles of range. It was plenty close enough to... <laughs> So I think Rivian, if you give me a ride, he said. Like a lot of electric vehicles has has one twenty volt AC power outlets. Four of them oh on the Rivian. Now you know the Ford Lightning. You can actually plug your house into if there's a power outage and run your house off of it. This is not that. This is just regular one twenty volt AC outlets. The doc, I guess, I don't know. Uh, what did he have to plug in? Lights. I would think it was says his electric cautery, cautery cautery. unit, which I would think would be more like a two twenty. I mean, that's my opinion as somebody Maybe. who uses electricity. But I, I mean, are I you know. under during this procedure? No, well, is there I can I can fill local. you in because I've had a vasectomy and uh, uh, yeah, no, you're not. Picture, Leo. <laughs> you're, wide, you're you're wide awake. Uh, but you're, really? you're anesthetized. It's a local. I hope it's a local. So what sort of a oh, car God. powered your vasectomy? <laughs> uh, fortunately, a, a I'll never know the power didn't go out, and we didn't have electric vehicles forward. way back then. Uh, this is actually probably the twenty uh, eighth anniversary of it because I got you it right shouted, after my son was born. You shouted Farfrak Nugan! Happy birthday! Happy birthday, vasectomy! <laughs> Farfrak Nugan! Uh, <laughs> they they plugged it in. Uh, electro cautery was normal. The procedure oh. went great, says Doctor Yang. Uh, I'm, I mean, I mentioned this story wow. to our own uh, house doctor, our physician in the IRC, Dr. Mom. Uh, she said, that's nuts. If you're getting a procedure and the power goes out, stop. <laughs> do not plug into your truck and continue. Look, Just wait. Okay, wait so Elon Musk piece. probably heard about this and then sat straight up in his bed and was like, we got to get a Tesla out there performing. Oh, yeah, because there's, there's one thing that Elon Musk did not get. It's a vasectomy. That's I think vasectomy. We all know. That, oh, that's true. He's probably very, he probably no, thinks this is a no. good advertisement. What's the opposite against, of yeah. that? He did something that's the opposite of that. I he think. had 10 children. Uh, IVF. He, he <laughs> did IVF. IVF with his executive oh to give her twins. Oh, oh, oh wait <laughs> a minute. Can you do that with they a didn't Tesla? Do, wait a minute. I didn't know this. I remember this, that the, the woman who runs yeah. the uh, neuro brain implant yeah. for him is pregnant with his twins, but I didn't understand It was that through IVF, They yes. didn't do it yeah. in the traditional method. As far as we know through legal documentation, yes, because she was able, they were both able to argue that it was a non-romantic encounter, so it didn't run afoul of HR uh, rules. By the I way, really, I did not say, and I hope I did not say this, that that Rivian vasectomy was nuts, did I? Hmm. No, I hope I did not say that. That would. Be I need a trombone. I need a trombone yeah. very quickly. Because yeah, the thing with this like story is, it, no matter how it goes, you're ending up as a news story, right? Yeah. 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 One way or how it came out, one way or another. Way or and another. Sue's doctor it. over. I was Rivian about to say, based. let's check back in with this guy in like a year or two to see if it, you know, actually was successful. Wow. Just wait. They're gonna do brisses next. That's gonna be. Oh there. lord. That's gonna be. Uh, Inside EVs says the R1T continues to prove its versatility. And oh I, and my I would, god! Come on. I would. Uh, I would agree. Uh, this the is other a power yeah. plant story. <laughs> the other story I would like to uh, mention. I don't know. Maybe this isn't the most exciting story. When I brought this up earlier uh, with another panel, they didn't like it, but I like it. Uh, the New York Times says. Oh, yeah. We can now talk to naked mole rats. And it turns out the naked mole rat has a fairly elaborate vocabulary. When the two rats meet in a dark tunnel, they exchange a standard salutation. They make a soft chirp and then repeating soft chirps, says Alison Barker, a neuroscientist at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research in Germany. They have a little conversation. Would you like to hear it? Here you go. From the courtesy of the New York Times, am I is my volume 
Turn down. Let me turn it up here. Oh, it's up to you, Benito. We're we're never going to know what the naked mole rat said. It's uh, Dr. Wow. Barker is uh, nominative determinism right there. I think she's studying animal talking. There it is. That's that's the two rats talking. The greeting call, which I thought was going to be pretty basic, turns out to be incredibly complicated, said Dr. Barker. Machine learning transformed my research. They're feeding animal sounds to machine learning systems to help them understand what the animals are doing and saying. And in fact, they've been able to see that there are multiple patterns. For instance... Not only does each mole rat have its own vocal signature. They don't have any clothes, but they have each, their own vocal signature. Each colony has its own distinct dialect, which is passed down culturally over generations. And this is the most interesting. During times of social instability, such as in the weeks after a colony's queen is violently deposed, the di <laughs> Wow. It's an, it's an elaborate story. We're just going full circle back to Game of Thrones. Wow. Here. The cohesive dialects fell apart. Then when the new queen begins her reign, a new dialect appears to take hold. I think that's fascinating. Ooh, it's all this blockchain. <laughs> yeah. Let's throw some blockchain at it. Throw some blockchain. Yeah, I know, but can uh, these rats go to the moon? Mm. That's yeah. the question. I've been, uh, I love this area. There was an article recently also about... Um, <clears throat> the systems that you've, uh, for dog and cat communication. Uh, Mary Robinette Cowell, uh, the science fiction writer, on her Instagram, she's been posting updates of uh, talking with her cat, Elsie, with one of those um, button-based systems. And it's really, I haven't seen anybody else use it as, uh, or, or document it as uh, publicly or uh, elaborately. And it is extraordinary to see what Elsie will say. Um, and Elsie will just walk across this thing that's full of buttons and not touch one, but like literally just walking like casually across it and then go to the right one and hit the thing wow. or several to express your thoughts. And you're like, there is intent. This is not trained. It's more sophisticated than that. How much is it real communication? It seems like it's fairly substantial actually, but you know, we always lay things on top of it. This but, is a little cleaner because um, you're not training the rats. You're just observing yeah, exactly. them, right? Yeah. And, and it's clear that there are a variety of vocalizations. There is uh, University of Washington, up your way, has uh, a software called Deep Squeak. Which <laughs> well played, University of Washington. Well played. <laughs> it can automatically detect, analyze, and categorize the ultrasonic vocalizations of rodents. Huh. It can also distinguish between the complex song-like calls the animals make when they're feeling good and the long, flat ones they make when they're not. You could tell if a rat's depressed. Uh, Deke Squeak... By that description, couldn't anybody? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you really look down in the mouth, Mr. Mister Rat. Deep Squeak has been repurposed for other species, including lemurs and whales. Uh, That's a very deep squeak. Mm. Uh, other I teams have developed their own systems for automatically detecting when clucking chickens... <laughs> Or squealing pigs are in distress. Often, it turns out when people are about to kill them. Yes, I, yeah, I was going to say, to... how are they making? Well, I wonder if stress. we if we could start to understand the animals, we may not be so likely to kill them. Right? Mm, mm. Well, they they uh, they might have a lot of things to say that we're not very interested in. Oh, they so may be so annoying that we want to yeah. kill them. Is that what you're thinking? You you learn a dialect, and you're like, oh my god, they won't shut up about that <laughs> new tree, the growth. Although I'd like to talk to crows. I think crows have a lot of interesting things to say. Yeah. Here's a recording uh, of fruit bats engaged in perch aggression, just in case you're interested. <laughs> Are they wearing hats? I think they're collars, probably. Oh, I also gosh. like that it looks like one of those, uh, yes, one of those classic uh, 1912, you know, black and white movies. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say this looks like Nosferatu is going to pop out <laughs> exactly. of the stage, right? right. So apparently, you, I said, "Why are you stealing the middle seat? Those armrests are mine." <laughs> no, that's exactly. Uh, like perform a vasectomy. No, the power is out. Apparently, uh, fruit bats fight uh, for a good position in the colony. And that's what they were. Uh, they were. They figured out they were doing. It looked like it, and that, in fact, that's what they were. Right. They were doing Project SETI, the Cetacean Translation Initiative, oh, C E T I, cute. bringing mm. together machine learning experts, experts, uh, machine biology. Ex Somebody perch. should. <laughs> we need a machine to understand me. A learning experts, machine biologists, roboticists, linguists, and cryptographers, 
to uh, detect what uh, whales are saying to one another. I think this is a very... You want to hear some whales? Sure. Why not? Yeah. I think this is a very... It's clicking. This is a really, to me, a very interesting application of machine learning. Figure out what this Whoa. is, what they're saying to each other. I love hmm. science because there's just like people sitting around being like, what are whales saying? And they get to figure it out. Yeah. yeah. And then, in theory, talk to the animals. That's a... Uh that's the slight, that's where there's a thin line between science and drug use. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just like, man, just what do you think whales, whales are talking about, yeah. man? The, uh, according to the New York Times, the prospect of ongoing two-way dialogue with other species remains unknown. But true conversations will require a number of prerequisites, including matching intelligence types, <laughs> compatible sensory systems, and crucially, a shared desire to chat. <laughs> Maybe the whales don't want to talk to us, and I cannot blame yeah. them for that. There has to be motivation on both sides to want to communicate. In your TikToks. Says Ma Natalie Wilmini, an expert on cognitive evolution, again, at the Max Planck Institute, but this time for evolutionary anthropology. Max Planck got around. Uh, and also, there's... Ec there's eth <laughs> Not like Max Elon Planck. Musk. <laughs> That's a different... Busy. That's a different. He was kind busy of, in a different fashion. You've got a different fashion. <laughs> there are two, busy two genres: <laughs> Max Planck and Elon Musk. Inside all of us, there are two. Yeah, two wolves. Two wolves. Max, Max, Max Planck and, and Elon, Elon Musk. Musk. It is. They are archetypes for us all. Wolves. Mr. Glenn Fleischman, uh, autodidact, Jeopardy contestant, creator oh. of. Amazing letterpress. What is this here? What is this? Flong fancier. A flong. Some He's a flong fancier. Yes. Some Seattle Star, a newspaper that's been out of business for seventy years. Flong and a mystery. I have. That's from what, is, War, World War Two. MacArthur yeah, faces all out assault. <clears throat> and the confusing part is this flong is a two-page tabloid style flong, but on the same purchase, I was able to obtain a full-page. <laughs> Broadsheet flong for that style of newspaper. Where does so one go flong. to acquire flongs? The uh, well, eBay. But then sometimes things happen. Like a guy from Sweden says, "Hey, I've got a couple hundred pieces of peanuts flong. You want it?" And they I just say, sure. open up their coat and they're like, "You want some flong?" That's a good question. Do you Swedish call those people flong, flong floggers or <laughs> flong, we, flog, we flog flong? Flog long time no see. Uh, you yeah. better explain for those who are not completely up on uh, antiquated newspaper technology what a flong is. Just got to always show you the flong, uh, not powered by my Rivian. <laughs> Leo. It's a, a actually the light a... switch on my lamp. It's, um... <laughs> oh, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, a good yeah. name for it. Uh, it's a flong was a, a mold used in uh, metal type days for when they when printing was all. So they poured lead type. into that uh, mold. Exactly. They'd make the flong under high pressure from like a laid out page of disparate elements like pieces of type and illustrations. Then they'd put that in a press to create a single sheet that they could then cast into a hemispherical or half a circular uh, metal plate that could go on a high speed rotary press and spin really fast and print you know vast numbers of newspapers every hour. So in every newspaper in the country, they had dozens of people like making like laying out pages making flongs making these plates putting on presses it was this incredibly wild amount of lead <laughs> pouring and it's, uh, it's just like it's a crazy industrial operation that every newspaper had to do until about the 70s or 80s and then it was utterly thrown out in favor of like a simpler photographic process that everyone uses now it's sad though uh, but thank yeah. goodness you're keeping the flong alive little aspects of it in history yeah. documenting it yeah Glenn, always a pleasure. Glenn F. Dot, or no, I'm sorry. Glenn dot fun. Two ends. God, you had this is your last opportunity. I know. I screwed it up every single time. Glenn I'm 100 percent easy now. to find me. Glenn dot fun. Glenn dot fun. In the name. And there's a lot of good stuff there. Uh, so great to see you. Thank you for being Thanks here. Thanks for having me. Great to be Dan here. Morin, Bayern Agenda, uh, Aleph Extraction, and the newest, the Nova Incident, all part of the Galactic Cold War saga. Great reading. Uh, I could I could vouch for it. Really good, surprisingly good. Really, uh, <laughs> once again, thank you. <laughs> thank you Shocked for... that a, a man like you could string a <laughs> sentence together. Just really, it's really. Remarkable. I look at you. I see nothing it's, it's behind those it's eyes. Remarkable. <laughs>
I, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, sixcolors.com, of course. Uh, anything, what, what are you going to be doing on Tuesday? Are you going to be doing a live thing or? Jason will be there at the uh, actual event, so I think he'll be doing some of the heavy lifting. But we'll have some stuff afterwards on the site, and I think we we'll, we may actually we start doing some like video like wrap ups afterwards, just sort of quick hit things to sort of discuss. So we might have one of those going up, um, and there'll be pl plenty more coverage to come on Six Colors. Excellent, excellent, and of course the wonderful Paris Martineau, the crafty Paris Martineau, more ways than one in the information dot com. Uh, there's your signal number. She's at uh, Paris Martineau on the Twitter. What are you working right now? Anything exciting? Um, I uh, cover Amazon, write about different parts of the business. If you work for Amazon or you used to, come chat with me on Signal. Talk off the record. Be really fun. Kind of like this chat, but also nice. about your work. Nice. You covering Amazon's all the unionization stuff, I assume? Yeah, I mean, that as well as I'm really interested in kind of the movements in healthcare right now, as mm. well as, um, I mean, I think everything going with Project Santos, it's a massive company. And I feel like every time I look in a different part of it, I find something more interesting. So always a pleasure. Thanks to all always three of you. A pleasure. This was so much fun. I hate to stop. I really do. Uh, we do twit every uh, Sunday about uh, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. 2100 UTC. So you can watch us do it live at live.twit.tv or chat with us live while you're watching at irc.twit.tv. Club members get to chat in our club Discord. If you're not a club member, seven bucks a month. Let me do a little pitch for this. Seven bucks a month gets you ad free versions of all the shows. You get access to the Discord, which is always full of fascinating stuff. We do events all the time. In fact, we have a fireside chat coming up September 22nd featuring club Twit members. Uh, Stacey Higginbotham's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, Hands-On Mac with Micah Sargent, Hands-On Windows with Paul Therott. There's just a ton of good stuff in there. And uh, all those shows also appear on the Twit Plus feed. So uh, I invite you to join us in the uh, Club Twit. Just go to twit.tv slash club twit for, uh, for information. Seven bucks a month. I think it's a good deal. And it helps us out, helps us smooth out the uh, rough edges in the ad world. Uh, after the fact, of course, though, we offer on-demand versions uh, ad-supported of all of our shows at twit.tv. You can also go to YouTube. Each cha show has its own YouTube channel, youtube.com slash thisweekintech. There's also, um, of course, the best way to get it, uh, sub the chance to subscribe in your favorite podcast player. That's free, despite the name. I know it confuses people, but it's free. Just follow us or subscribe to us, uh, and you'll get it the minute it's available. So you have it in time for your Monday morning commute. I hope you don't commute tomorrow because it's Labor Day. Have a great Labor Day weekend. Uh, go out and barbecue. For, don't forget, no more uh, white pants or white shoes after tomorrow. <laughs> this is it. Last chance. Get those shoes on, and we'll see you next time. Another twit is in the can. Bye-bye.